But if you're tuning in, we're back in LA. It's also like podcast, the most authentic, most organic podcast out here, baby. Let's go. So I was working on this intro yesterday, and I had told Dylan, man, we are sitting with a writer, a producer, an actor, a veteran, and most importantly, with a husband and a dad. Yeah. Right. He's a father. He's a husband. And you probably have seen him already recently. Stay in tune for Mayans MC. But we're seeing one Vincent Rocco Vargas, baby. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for, for sitting down with us, bro. I know you, you've been on a schedule, you're traveling, you're doing everything. But thank you so much for giving us your time to sit down, conversate. And, um, you know, I know Dylan hasn't been paying attention, but this is Dylan, everybody, again. We're back. <laughs> How you been, bro? How's it living? Good, 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 good. Uh, thriving right now, you know what I'm saying? Everything's moving in the right direction and trying to keep it that way. Man, loving. You are on a purposeful journey right now. Always. You, you are. We're, we had a great conversation right now outside of camera, but for the people that don't know you, what do you do? Where do you come from? What, where did you grow up? Oof. Uh, well, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, man. I grew up in the 818. Um, you know, my father, who was a from New York, a street kid, came here, moved to L.A., lived in East L.A., and kind of became a street kid there as well. Mm. Got himself in trouble and joined the, joined the Marines and eventually met my mom. My mom comes from uh, very humble beginnings. I'm talking very poor, picking cotton and strawberries just to get by to help the family kind of thing, you know. And uh, she left... Uh, Canotillo, Texas, to to follow a dream, and you know, it's the dreamer and the believer, man. My pops and my mom, they 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 made it happen, and so we were raised right there in the San Fernando Valley. My father became an LA City firefighter. He did that for 32 years. My mom worked for the LA Unified School District in the space of uh, special education, and she she really was just kind of a coordinating for for travel for the kids who who had special needs and needed to get to school. And so, you know, they both picked up their little retirements and stuff. But, but you know, everything that I have instilled in me is from those two. You know what I mean? Like, like they're, uh, they've been really good influence in us. Whether like, whether whether uh, it was verbally or just actions. You know what I'm saying? Because my dad wasn't much of a speaker. He was more of a man of action. You know was he more like, he's just going to give you that look and you already knew what that meant? That was the beast, dog. <laughs> that was the beast. I called him the beast in my head because he was scary as fuck, bro. Like, uh, it's like, uh, uh, what's that? Beauty and the Beast when everyone's scared of Scared to fuck with the beast. That's what my yeah. dad was, man. He, you know, walked on eggshells with him. But Jeez. he's a very stern character, very, very man, man and expected discipline and, and expect you to, to to wake up and do work. You know, he, he's a hardworking dude. Yeah. Um, intimidating, but as well as, a, you know, you can see how, how much he respected us as a family and how much he wanted to do for us, but how hard he worked. You know, he was working at the LA, at the LA uh, you know, LAFD, you know, Los Angeles Fire Department. But then when he wasn't working there, he was doing contracting on the side, you know what I'm saying, just to put some more money in the pocket, you know. Mm. He, he rebuilt our house from a, from a three-bedroom house to a six-bedroom house. You know, he did, he's just a hard worker, bro. He's, he's the dude that wouldn't stop. And so, Are you a middle child, oldest, youngest? I'm the youngest, but a set of twins. So I have a twin sister. Oh, oh man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's two minutes older, so yeah, I'm the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> By two minutes. By two minutes. Yeah. yeah. How is that relationship? Because with, 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 with your sister, like growing, growing up in San Fernando, you have two amazing parents, hardworking parents, and you are growing up with your older sister, yeah. but you guys are literally right next to each other in timeline, right? Because yeah. usually I went to high school with my sister for like a year. I, did you go with? With my brother, I think two year, one year. One year. One yeah. year, I think. But it's, it's not the same because they were already were established yeah. beforehand, and you guys are establishing yourself in elementary, junior high, high school. Yeah. So how was that for you? You know, like, people ask me all the time, how was it? But the truth is, like, it's all I know. I don't know what it's like to be not have a twin sister, dog. My whole life I've had her. You know what I'm saying? We've been in school together my whole life. I've fought all kinds of motherfuckers just to get off her ass. You know what I'm saying? It's that's just, right, that's right. It's just <laughs> been, it was, it was our lifestyle. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, my dad was like, no, anyone mess with her, you take care of it. So, like from elementary all the way to high school if I ever had to fight for I would you know what I mean but that's all I knew uh we're not I don't think we were really close in the sense like this deeper closeness of twins we were brothers and sister and we had our internal jokes between each other 
she called me dirt. I called her roach. It was just a thing we did. You know what I mean? Just talk shit to each other. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And um, it was just it was just a brother sister thing. I didn't. I don't even think we acknowledged the twin thing as much as everyone else did. I yeah, think it's, yeah. I think it's interesting for other people. For us, it, it's Normal. what we it's what we know. Yeah. And so yeah, like yeah. our birthdays are together, and that's never been a thing. Who gets friend. who gets celebrated? You or her? It's the same. It's the same. Mm. Two cakes. You know what I mean? Or one cake with two things on it. You know, it's it's, it's all the same. You know. Yeah. So there's no, I never felt. I never felt it was it was anything special at the same time. I never felt it was anything different. It was just what I know. Um, she was smart as fuck. I wasn't. You know what I'm saying? She wouldn't let me cheat off her test. That always sucked. <laughs> you know? That's a difference right there. Yeah, yeah. But, but she two would, minutes of a difference makes. Yeah, bad. yeah. I'm like, okay, two minutes, you know? That two minutes too long, man. Fuck my brain up, I guess, you know? <laughs> but, uh... She, uh, you know, she's a good athlete, so she was good at sports. I was good at sports. People would talk shit on that, like she's a better hitter than you. And I'm like, well, it's softball, dog, chill. <laughs> 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 but you know, like all in all, like I don't think we knew any different. As as time has got older, and 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 I've kind of gone on my journey in life, um, my closeness to my brothers and sisters has definitely fallen apart, uh, and not in a bad way. Like there's no bad blood or anything. I just kind of, I, I kind of had to take my life and, and, and run with it. Yeah. And, um, which had me being the one that left the family compared to the others. And so there's always been a kind of a rebuilding phase that we still work on, right? Like we're not as close as we used to be. I know that. And I don't call my brothers and sisters every day to check on them. I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think like that. And, and that's probably something I could work on. But for me, man, like my, I've, I've had a, I've had to keep my life together, you know? So for me, it's like, I don't want to pull no one into my world of shit, you know? Yeah, it's different. Um, so in that growing up phase, right, because we'll get into the, the sport-wise, for the people that don't know, when you're growing up, did you have a moment where you knew your life just, like, shifted? Like, it, you're going down this route, and then something just happened to you, whether it's physically, mentally, or whatever, and you just kind of had to, like, reroute a little bit. Not in my world, man. My world was like I always knew because I was either had to, but sports, baseball sp especially, was in my heart since a kid, bro. Like I was writing poems in kindergarten about how, you know, the, the stars are home runs from legends of baseball kind of thing. Like baseball has been in my heart since I was little, dog. It's the, f so the first thing I played it. Like I, it was that was it for me. I, I knew I wanted to play pro ball since four and that never changed. The only problem is that when you get to about 11, 12, 13, you see all the homies going on the street and hanging out and shit, and you don't get to, you know, it gets like, well, that seems more attractive than fucking playing baseball every day. Yeah. But my father, I told you, he was part of the streets, and my brother got himself involved in that shit, and I was the guy they weren't going to let happen to. So I remember saying, like, hey, Dad, I want to quit. And he's like, fuck, no, you ain't going to quit. And he's like, if you quit, you're coming home, and I got a list of shit you're going to do. And I'm like, nah, fuck that. I'll go back. <laughs> yeah. I'll go play. I'll go back. Go back. <laughs> like, that was his way of keeping me off the street. That was his way of not, not and not, again, it was, a, it was a way of putting something in front of me that wasn't going to push me towards gangs yeah. or, or just that life, you know what I'm saying? I, I think I, I heard it in a 50 Cent uh, video, and he was just like, people that found the streets were... Because of the glamour, the the attention, and and the respect that people were getting, right, and mm -hmm. that's why it was easier for people to fall into that type of lifestyle, right. But then you get the if you go this way, this is gonna happen to you, motherfucker. <laughs> nah, never mind that. That's yeah, well, it's like like it's, it's worse consequences. Yeah, well, I'm I'm sitting in school and I got all all the homies, and if you don't play sports, you're part of some kind of crew. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. You're, you're doing something, whether it's an, an official gang or just a crew of homies. They're always into mischievous shit, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I had, I'd walk home from school, I'd get on my bike and ride to baseball practice, and like that was my mindset. It was just like I was, I was playing sports no matter what. And then you go into college, somehow, <laughs> some way, dog. You know, <laughs> where where'd you go to college? Uh, the first school was Valley Community College, and then uh, then I went to Glenda Community. I transferred out and went to Glenda Community College. Got into a little bit of trouble, just dumb kid shit, you know. Um, the coaches we weren't seeing eye to eye. So incident happened when I was going to fight with the dude at a pager shop. He thought I was a uh, toxic to the team. He started talking shit. I talked shit back. And boom. Next team. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, bro, you know, the dream was to try and go pro. The dream was trying to get a scholarship. But my education, you know, I was dyslexic. And, and, and at the time, it was, it was uh, something that I was embarrassed to tell people that I couldn't read. You know, I graduated high school at like a fifth grade reading level. Um, you know, it wasn't unfamiliar for me to fuck up my name on a test because I was rushing and like things are getting confusing for me. Like, 
it's a, it's a trip. So, so I left high school with my mom and dad and everybody not realizing that I couldn't read because I have a big ass smile on my face. I'm cool to people. I'm Mr. Congeniality in this bitch and I'm good at baseball. You know, I'm passing with C's and D's and getting fucking summer schools and all this shit, dog. And yeah. I fucking finagled my way through high school without being able to read. So then, yeah. so then it's like, I ain't taking that. I took the PSATs, right? Which to, to get a scholarship, you have to take the ACTs or the SATs. Yeah, they took, fucked you up on that. Yeah. <laughs> He's so like, I, yeah. I took that shit in. Yeah. <laughs> I think the only thing I got right was my fucking name. Well, I'm saying, you get like 600 points to get your name. I'm pretty sure I barely got that right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Bro, that was so, me. Yeah. And the craziest thing. part is that I don't think now you got to be, you don't got to take them anymore. Well, because of the COVID thing, yeah, my daughter's dealing with that right now. Like some schools are like, no, nah, don't, it's waived, right? Yeah. You just have to have a degree, uh, have a have a, a high school diploma, right? Yeah, and applied and have good <laughs> grades or whatever. But yeah. it's like, damn, I have good grades. But because of my scores. Bro, if it was my time, I would have been able to get a scholarship because I was good enough to play ball. You know what yeah. I'm saying? I was a big-ass dude. Not big, but I was a good-sized kid, with left-handed ball player. That's, a, that's an interesting thing in baseball, right? I threw hard. And so it, everything would have been a winning combination. But, um, you know, I took that PSATs and realized real fast, like, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, the idea was go to junior college, and in junior college baseball, you can get drafted after two years. Yeah. So I'm like, well, fucking shine, homie. Like, let's do it, you know? Um, but you know, what came with that was all the immaturity of just like drinking and partying and, you know, and, and that ended up being, you know, really why my career ended up ending. Uh, I left Glenda community college. I played, I played Glenda community college. We went to the junior college world series. It was a fucking blast. I had guys like Fernando Valenzuela jr. On my team. Yeah, so like Fernando was it Fernando yeah. Valenzuela was in the stands, <laughs> homie. You're like, yo, what up, dog? You know, heavy hitters, bro. Yeah, bro. So we had some we had some dudes go pro eventually, and and, and it was a cool team. But I got in, I got like life got hard for me, dog, and I ended up finding a way to go play up north because like I, I couldn't get eligible. I'm like, well, I'll play summer somewhere else. I called some homies that were up in Chico State, and uh, I played the summer out in Chico State on, on a small team called Chico Sticks, and I had a fucking hell of a season, like. Home runs up the fucking nap, everything, bro. I was killing it. And a, a team in Kentucky called me one morning. I remember the call. He's like, hey, uh, I want to offer you a full ride. And I was like, Psh, yeah, let me call Say my less. pops. You know what I mean? I called my dad. I was like, dad, I got a full ride in Kentucky. He's like, let's do it. You know, so we packed all my shit and I drove to Kentucky. And, uh, bro, I didn't even get to the season, dog. I ended up being academically ineligible again, man, just because, like, I couldn't handle the, the pressure of just being out there alone. I couldn't get my schooling done. Can't tell people you can't fucking read. Yeah. All these things, bro, I wasn't willing to fucking... But, but at know. that point, you you weren't... Were you not ready to ask for help? Hell no, bro. I didn't do help? No, what? <laughs> I'll burn in my own, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> this shit's going down, homie. I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> No, bro. I was I was a 21 year old kid that had a baby on the way, and you know the dream of baseball. I see it fading. I see it fading, bro. Because like I just keep getting, bro. My first night in Kentucky, I'm at an Applebee's. I'm drunk as fuck out of my wazoo, dog. I had this tall ass beer, a half beer, and an empty beer, and I'm saying fuck you, fuck you, fuck you to the bartender, dog. This is how crazy I was fuck at the time. Shit. And he goes, "Hey, there's a family rush," and I'm like, "Fuck you, motherfucker!" Blah blah blah. And he comes around, we start scrapping, and boom, I get put in a cop car, right? The cop goes, hey, you're that dude from California. I was like, yeah. He goes, what bar you want to go to next? I was like, bro, this is Varsity Blues in this bitch? What the fuck? <laughs> hey, yo. Like, He's like, this is Varsity Blues. Yeah, in like, they all knew who I was. Like, they took me to an, I've just gone to fight at Applebee's, dog. They dropped me off at Buffalo Wild Wings. So I showed up and kept drinking. They're like, and, go get your ass kicked over there. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> what it's like, but if that's how they're going to handle me, like, no repercussions, no, no accountability, dog. Just like, okay, go to the next one. Well, the rest of the year was like that. And so I obviously didn't get shit done. Oh, I was yeah. just, I was, a, I was the king, bro. Like there was four of us that came from California. We were kings. And then just let it, and let it ruin my career. So when it was time to let go of this dream that you had since four years old, because I think me and him, we've gone through it too. Hispanic parents playing soccer. I'm going pro. las chivas, everything. And my dad going to take me to Tijuana to go play and shit like that. And then there's a point where we all realize. Me chingue la rodilla. My knee fucked up. You know, I could have gone pro, bro. Mira, mijo, mira. Yo puedo jugar para las chivas USA, pero me chingue la rodilla, güey. But there's a point in our life where we realize that the dream that we once had as a kid is no longer obtainable. Mm -hmm. Right? Because of the decisions. Or are and I call, I say it now and I and um 
not ashamed of it. I wasn't as dedicated as I know I needed to be to be a part of that 1% yep. that moves on. Yeah. Right? Because even to get into a to college ball, you got to be a part of a 3% out of fucking a million kids that are yep. trying to get there. And then to be a part of that draft, to get to that next pro level, you got to be that like thin 1% yep. that just has it. Yeah. And so for you, how was that letting go of that dream? I tr- I try not to. I went to some other. Uh, was, in, um, went was, to, was that like a wake up moment for you, or bro? I would wasn't letting it go for a minute. I, I went to some independent pro tryouts and I kept getting cut. And I'm like, these guys are idiots. These guys don't know shit. They, right? don't, know, they don't know who's here. But the reputation precedes them. Like, everyone knows who the fuck I am. I'm an idiot. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I'm a I'm a I'm a drunk. I was a fighter. I was a just a punk ass. Right. And so. You know, uh, I tried a little bit longer and I found myself working at a Texas roadhouse in Kentucky and spending my tips at the bar. And the cycle of that for a couple months was like, fuck, dog. (laughs) What next, bro? And I have a daughter, right? My daughter was born and I wasn't with the baby's mom at the time. And so it was just kind of like the pressure of like, I can't even like I look at my mom and dad who were good parents. And I've never had a problem. I've hearing I was going to have a kid was dope. It was like dope bro I'm gonna be a dope ass dad I'm gonna be a dope ass dad but then hey do you have money for uh, diapers like nah let me call my mom you know what I mean hey you have money for for, you know nah let me call my mom and that started to feel like damn that's not a good dad (laughs) like I'm not doing what I what I think my dad would be doing I'm not I'm not being that dude I'm over here in Kentucky and she's over there even though I don't have a relationship with the mom, I, I still wanted to, to be a good dad. And so, you know, I found myself at a bar, bro. I was at Buff- that same Buffalo Wild Wings, dog. You know what I mean? Like, here's my, you know, hey. <laughs> I'm they, back. They all know my drink, right? You know, <laughs> I got my spot, you know. And, we uh, all got those places. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Hey, the same thing? Exactly. And then you're with people. Dude, do you come here often? Nah, bro, nah. Same exact chair, homeboy. <laughs> That's my name on the trivia. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm sitting next to the homie who who was uh, one of the steak the steak cooks at Texas Roadhouse, <clears throat> and he did time in the Navy. He's an old cat, and uh, we're watching CNN at the time, and it was during the war, bro. And fucking, there's a Marine who puts this the American flag over the Saddam statue, and they end up pulling the statue down. And it was a gorgeous moment, bro. And it was a time that I think anyone in my age would would remember that moment. Yeah. And I'm sitting there drinking my beer, and I'm and I'm watching this. And they interview the family, right? They interview the brothers and sisters, the mom and dad, and they're all crying, like we're so proud of our boy, blah blah blah. And I'm like, bro, oh, I don't think anyone's done that for me, <laughs> homie. I'm not making no one <laughs> proud right now, dog. I'm in the middle of Owensboro, Kentucky, <laughs> fucked up a scholarship, got a baby over there. Like, there ain't nothing going right right now, right? And I think my family all knows. And 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 I I I felt I felt fucked up, like what the fuck am I doing with myself, dog? This dude's in Iraq doing some shit right now, bro. His family's proud of him, dog. And like, I can't even, my, my daughter wouldn't be proud of what the hell I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, I talked to my boy and he's like, do it. Next morning I go to the military recruiter and, and join, dude. And I said, fuck it. You beat me to the question. <laughs> I knew that was coming, that but was, was that not scary? Bro, when I lost baseball, I was ready to die. That was my life. That was everything to me. I didn't know what a life without it. Did not. It was, I still intimately love the game of baseball in a way that most people never understand unless you've been at that level, if you've played it that, yeah. that deep. It's to me, it's the first heartbreak. It's my first love. Um, I try and explain to my kids how beautiful the game is because it's, it's more than a game. It's this really interesting, it's romantic, homie. It's yeah. romantic. It's because like you, you were at the, the closest to what everybody sees, which is the MLB, right? You were there. You were in the process. You were in the gutter. You were in the trenches to the point where it was in your palm of your hands. Homie, you le- wanted to. Homies to the left and right were there. Yeah. And I felt like I can compete with them too. And so it was like, oh, I let that slip. Yeah. Like, I think anybody that has played a sport to that collegiate level have been around players that have played in a semi-pro or close to that that end up at a juco because we just all fucked it up. Yeah, it's not about, like, the best dudes don't always make it. Yeah. You know, it's the dudes that are well-rounded, mature, all those things, right? They the, have everything. Yeah, the, the guys who are well-rounded, who, who it's, it's a war of attrition. Yeah. This life is, dog. What I do now is a war of attrition. Everything I've done is a war of attrition. So if you got all the fucking, the right elements, bro, you don't have to be the greatest dude in the room. You just got to sustain this shit long enough. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And, and I'll I, last everybody. That's it. And I wasn't that dude, bro. Your f- <laughs> your first 
when you left, uh, what is it, on, on the airplane, right? When mm-hmm. you left for the Army, what was that emotion? Oh, I didn't give a fuck, dog. It was, uh, mm. I took out two credit cards, $2,000 each, and I spent the fuck out of them because I said, well, if I die, I don't have to pay that shit. <laughs> 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 we bought, I bought everyone at the bar drinks. We threw big parties, bought kegs, and, and I said, we're going to Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and fuck it. The idea was this, dog. Fucking if I die, shit. if I die, I actually fulfill a lot of things. My family would be proud because I did something bigger than myself. My daughter would have the money because it's about $450,000 your daughter gets or your family gets for your death. Okay? And I would say I'm, I, I serve my country, which means it's, it's something that's n- the least selfish thing I could possibly do because I'm a selfish motherfucker at this time. I give my daughter money that she can sustain herself that I couldn't provide for anyways. And my family can say, oh, he, he died serving his country proud. Yeah. It was the answer to all the holes in my game, dog. So I didn't give a fuck at the time. Yeah, There was a time I did, but I'm saying at that time, I'm like, yeah. I j- bro, I joined, I said, what's the hardest thing you got that I can get? They said, uh, special forces or army ranger. I said, Okay, well, I took the test. I didn't pass. I didn't score high enough for special forces. You got to be a 110. I was a 108. There wasn't a two-point waiver at the time. So I said, Army Ranger, fuck it, let's go. No clue, dog. I thought I was going to be the only Army Ranger in the whole fucking thing. I'm like, cool, there's a, there's a job called Army Ranger. I watched Black Hawk Down. I was like, damn, that shit is dope as fuck. Let's go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then, you know, I get through the training. I get through this. I, get, I, t- I start realizing, like, well, shit, I ain't bad at this job, dog. I can carry the weight. I can do the PT people i'm older i'm 23 years old i'm around a bunch of 17 year old motherfuckers right now i got a kid already dog so like my mind is in a different place so like these dudes are coming to me like hey can you help me shine your i'm like bitch get here boom you know what i mean so i kind of became a leader in that world when i was already kind of a leader in my world as as an athlete you know you kind of take that position Mm -hmm. but the leadership in military is a little different right and so i started like boom taking charge and i was like okay i'm all right at this dog which is the first time in my life i'm good at something other than baseball Mm -hmm. you know so it felt like Maybe this is right for me, dog. Maybe it is. And then 30, 30, 40 days later, I'm fucking packing all my shit for Afghanistan. And, uh, yeah, after all the training, uh, you know, we get to the unit. And, you know, about 30, 45 days later, we're, we're headed to Afghanistan. And as I'm packing the thing, I'm, I'm, it's starting to set in, dog. Like, yo, I might get fucked up, you know. And uh, one of the older, his name is uh, Sergeant Campbell, uh, he goes, Hey, Vargas, you nervous? I'm like, yeah, kind of, kind of, you know, he's like, well, don't worry about it. He said some kind of statistic, like 90% of people that go overseas never see combat, never see action. And he goes, then he goes like something like 7%, uh, never get to engage. And then that only that 2% or so, or 3%, you know, actually see engagement. I'm like, okay. Sits a little more comfortable. Bro. Then you get Within there. the first mission, dog, like, we're <laughs> roping in contact. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I was a 3%. Yeah, like, how did, it, how did that happen? <laughs> and it's funny because we're hearing there's contact. I don't know if there is or not, but in the radio, you're hearing it, and people, you see their eyes kind of lit up, and I'm like, damn, they're like, lock and load, lock and load. So I'm locking and loading, and fucking they drop the ropes, and people are starting to fast rope out, and I'm like... Bro, first mission ever with roping? Like, that's not a, that's like the not the thing you want, right? Like, bro, please say psych. Please yeah, say psych. Yeah, bro. bro. And so then there's, it, like, I'm thinking, like, oh, fuck, dudes are getting fucking popped left and right. My head's taking me everywhere, bro. Yeah. And I look down and I see dudes crawling and I'm like, oh, shit, dog. I'm about to get picked off this rope as I go, dude. And so you just like, fuck it. Boom, and you go, right? And I'm like, vroom, boom, hit the floor on my back, get up and start running. And they're like, come on, go, 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 go. And I'm going, boom, take a knee. And I look around, and I'm like, dude, all these dudes are dead, bro? Nah, bro, two dudes broke their ankles, and everyone tripped over them, homie. <laughs> Yo. But my head is like, oh, my God, they're all. And, like, like I just. Adrenaline just. Yeah, yeah. bro, like, like, dude, new to the game, bro. So at, at that point, when you, <laughs> when you hit the floor, did you give a fuck about your life? No. It, it, at no point was it, at that moment, was I thinking about, like, it's like in a, in a sport, like in football. You're not thinking about like, I hope I don't get hurt while I get tackled. You're just like, go, motherfucker, go. And if you get hit, you get hit. Yeah. It's all or nothing. So it's just, I'm in the moment, bro. I'm like, yeah. the training takes over, which at that time, I didn't have a lot of training, but just enough to like, follow who? Him? Go. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's kind of how they do it. Like, you have a senior dude, and that's a dude. Like, you follow me wherever the fuck I go. You shoot wherever I fucking go. All right, you do whatever I do. You're like, okay. And so I'm just looking for my dude, and I'm like, and he's like, let's go. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, like, it's like Forrest Gump. I'm like, whatever you say, dog, I'm in, you know? <laughs> 
<laughs> and so you just just fucking just running and gunning, bro. And at the time, since I'm a big fucking dude, I'm an anti tanker, which is like um, I carry the big shit, homie. Like I carry the big rocket launcher, and my boy was the rocket gunner, and I carry all the rounds and shit, right? Shit. And all these dudes are fucking hurt. So they're like, hey, drop that, take your rifle, let's go. And now I'm clearing rooms with these dudes. I'm like, damn, bro, I've never done this shit you know, in, our, in Afghanistan, bro. She was living the Call of Duty life, bro. Yeah, bro. Hell yeah. Yeah, bro. It was um. <laughs> it, it was definitely like an eye opener. I don't think I thought about the potential of dying. Probably that whole deployment. I think it was just so much happening so fast in my life. Yeah, I think because how you said, like you were already struggling with trying to get a scholarship and get to the dream. And then you find yourself in Kentucky, you know, not going in the path that you imagine you would be at that age having your daughter feeling like i mean reality feeling like a disappointment yeah. to everybody that that's back home that when you left it was more like well i'm not doing anything good this is the fulfillment to kind of make up for everything i've been fucking up in the last couple months year that you had this moment where maybe i do have a purpose now yeah bro Maybe I do have a purpose in this world, in this life, that was not just drinking at a Buffalo Wild Wings and an yeah. Applebee's, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> Spending, like, that's, sometimes maybe you can call it, that's like the, your, your, eye, your opening moment in your life where you're just like, how you said, maybe yeah, I'm good at something else yeah. other than baseball. Yeah, it definitely was like, okay, we can do, we can do this. And then, then I started wanting to live. Right? I started thinking, like, well, what's after this, dog? You know what I'm saying? Like, after you, you do this and you're good at it and you start seeing, like, there's more out there, I'm like, ooh, what can I do with this, right? And so I started planning, like, after, right? I remember that same deployment, like, at the end of it, we're on the top of fucking Afghanistan mountain and shit. We're, all, we're preparing for a mission. Yeah. And I tell the squadron, I was like, what do you want to do when you get out? You know, he's like, oh, I don't know, maybe be a cop or something. I'm like, yeah, cool, man. He goes, you already thinking about getting out? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like yeah. motherfucker, you just got here. Yeah, like, I'm six months into my contract, homie. And I'm already thinking about what's next, right? Like, <laughs> I was like, man, now, now, but the thing is, you can't plan for that shit unless you plan on getting out, right? Unless you plan on living, right? So then, then that started to kind of like, okay, man, I got to do this. I got to do good at this. I got to be good at this motherfucker right here so I can go do something next. You know what I mean? And then as it started to mature, right? Like, I mean, you mature so fucking fast when you're in the military, dog, that... You know, I was able to rekindle that relationship with my with my baby's mom. You know what I mean? And, and I moved her to Washington. And we, we got married. And we started trying to work on that deal. Because I was like, let's separate from all the bullshit. Let's just try and do this. I'm a grown-ass man now. I got my bill. I can pay the bills. You know, as, I, as we're trying to work on that shit, like, everything started coming to perspective. Like, no, nah, I want to be there for my fucking kid, dog. I want to, I wanna, you know, this right now is what's helping me. So, like, when I got back from that deployment, I was in a, a whole different mindset, man. You found a reason to live. Like, you were yeah. actually thinking about, once I'm done here, and before, like, you weren't even considering what a, what, what if in a year. Yeah. So, yeah. you leave your first deployment. I think you went on three, right? I went on three, yeah. So, the first one was Afghanistan. The second one was Iraq. Um, I was supposed to go to ranger school at the time, which is, in, in the ranger world, that training is significant to be able to promote. But... I knew that Iraq was on the pipeline, right? I knew we we were about to go to Iraq, and I, and uh, two parts, man. You fall in love with the with the job, bro. You fall in love with going to war. You know, you become a war dog, bro. You wanna you train, you train hard. You wanna play hard, dog. Explain that for like so all your the veterans that are listening into you, <laughs> the 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 guys that are newbies that just went in that don't know what that means, that don't know that feeling, or yeah. can explain it into words if you can yeah, try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when you're living in the combat world, there's you don't have to worry about who's paying the bills. You don't have to worry about anything other than, am I going to get shot in the face? That's it. It's actually kind of fucking relieving, dog. There's no pressure. Go do a mission. You might get killed. You might not. That's it. That's your only stress, dog. And that actually is fucking, you welcome that shit. It quiets everything in the world, right? And the crazy thing about that is, I don't think about my kids. I actually learned this from my, my, my mentor who was killed, and we'll talk about later, but, you know, I don't put pictures of my kids and my wife up because they're a distraction because the motherfuckers I love is to the left and the right of me. And if I do my job here, I'll get to live that life. But if we don't get our job done here, 
well, then we ain't going back to that either. Mm. So there's a level of it that there's nothing in life of playing the game of life and death. There's nothing like it. There's no chase you could ever, there's no heroin, there's no drug, there's nothing that'll fulfill that, that energy of, okay, I might get fucking shot in the face. Let's go. Bop. Bro. And so when you leave that world, then you come home, it's like, oh, the bills, the fucking your relationship, you fucking this, and like all these, everyone expects all this fucking shit from you, dog. And you're like, fuck this, dude. Put me back in war, homie. That was easy. Come home, this shit is hard as fuck, dog. I gotta fucking learn how to love my wife again when I haven't seen her in fucking five months. And I love the dudes who left and ride me more than her because every time we talk, it's a fucking argument. Fuck that, dog. I gotta learn how to be a dad and I don't even have the patience to fucking change a diaper right now because that shit is just too much for me, homie. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a, it's a crazy thing. You're dealing with trauma. You're dealing with stress. You're, but overseas, you got one mission, dude. You only deal with one stress or one yeah, thing. Your, and your job is to kill or capture, bro. Kill or capture a terrorist organization, bro. Disrupt them. You come home, it's like, now you got to fucking hold down the fort in your own house, and that shit's hard as fuck, bro. So what was your... I just wanted to keep going to war. You know what I'm saying? I wanted. To, I, I was happier there because it was less bullshit. And I didn't have a healthy relationship. I, my relationship was terrible. I won't dig into that because it's, it's, I, my whole thing is that out of respect... We were young and fucking knuckleheads, right? And we both didn't know what the fuck how to how to manage a healthy relationship, and so uh, it wasn't it wasn't going as planned, bro. Yeah. And uh, you know, I come home and I want to drink and, and play video games with the dudes I was overseas with. I didn't even want to acknowledge that I had a family because that was the hard thing, you know. And so then you go back to the job, and everyone's like, "Well, look, we're gonna go. You can go to Ranger School, or you can miss Ranger School, which means I miss a a, a promotion, and go to Iraq. Send me to Iraq, dog. Let's go." Boom, six months later, I'm in Iraq. That was the first time that I was like, they say there's no atheist in a foxhole. You ever heard that? Yeah, there's no, they say there's no atheist in a foxhole. In the military, the thing called a foxhole, it's a fighting position yeah. in war, right? And they say there's no atheist in a foxhole, meaning like everybody finds God in war, bro. You know what I'm saying? I find myself on the way to a mission and like, you know, my struggle with my relationship with God has been since I was a kid going to Catholic church. I'm like, man, this shit is whack, right? In my head, I'm like, mom, mom keeps making me wear a fucking tie and I got to kneel and sit and kneel and sit. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm going up to the priest and trying to tell him lies that I don't even believe in. Like, well, tell me your sins. I'm like, uh, I fucking lied to my mom. I stole a candy bar. I don't know. I'm trying to find shit because I felt guilty, homie, right? You can't and, even tell him like the real, yeah, like, I, yeah. I cussed at my mom. Yeah, I just say shit just because like, I don't know, man, I'm a fucking 10 year old kid. Like, I'm a, yeah. you know, I lied, you know? And so like, I struggled with that faith, dog. And then eventually as I went to Kentucky, I found like the Christianity faith. So, so I became like more of a Christian than Catholic, right? And I just started like, I started doing that deep dive. And then, then I started like, man, Life ain't going so hard. I lost baseball. Fuck God, fuck God at that time, right? And I was just like fighting with him, you know? And then I'm in, Af I'm in Iraq and I actually want to live. And I'm like, yo, dog, here I am. Um, I'm yeah, back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, <laughs> like, um, let's, let's circle back on that convo, dog, you know? And, and I started praying more again. I started like having a routine before the mission, just saying, big dog, um, take care of my kids. Take care of my wife. Uh, make sure they're good. And um, I love them. I would love to get home again. You know what I'm saying? And if that was what he wanted, I was down with it, dog. At the same time, if I was meant to fucking die, I was down with it. But I actually had the conversation, you know? And my daughter, bro, she became such an important part of my soul. You know, every, every, every achievement I had in the military, the relationship with my, my ex was, was rough, dog. So, so it never was, she was not the focal point of my motivation. It was my daughter at the time. And it was like one day she's going to see me walk across the stage and she's going to be so proud of me, dog. And uh, everything I ever did was like, she's going to be proud of me. She's going to be proud of me. And so I just sat there thinking like, like she's going to be proud. And, and it's always a vision of me walking across stage and winning an award or, or getting some kind of acknowledgement. And, and that's been my motivation. And with each kid I end up having, it continued to be the motivation. They're all cheering me on, dog. You yeah. Know? Love it, bro. And so through, through Iraq was get me home. Get me home. And, you know, we, we had some crazy engagements. We had, you know, we had dudes get hurt. I had the truck in front of me get blown the fuck up. I had, uh, you know, we got into an ambush with one woman. And, 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 and there's things in combat that will stick with me forever, dog. There's things that, that you know, um, 
I think war was expected. But what wasn't expected is what hurts my heart. You know what I'm saying? The empathetic side of it mm -hmm. is I knew what my job was, dog, and I ain't afraid of fucking kicking the door and taking out a bad dude. Bro, that's what we do. But the residual effects of that, of the family members crying or potential innocent bystanders being affected or hurt in the confrontation, I wasn't ready for that. That was the, that's the hard pill to swallow, dog. And I'm already in this relationship with God. I'm like, yo, dog, you're not going to judge me for this shit, are you? Yeah. You know, that was like, that was my, that was like, I just started this again. I just started just trying to believe, you know, and, and I feel like right away you're going to be like, bro, really? Like, <laughs> you know, like you're a part of this, like in one mission, even if it wasn't me at the hand of, uh, of an innocent by bystander being hurt because... There's collateral damage in war, dog. There's shit you can't, ex you don't expect. There's shit that just happens. There's a lot, bro. And so in that idea, I felt that um, just being a part of it, um, it would be, it, it doesn't look good. And, uh, and it made me really uh, empathetic to, to all these innocent people who just were, were in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know what I'm saying? So. Okay, come on, a little, come on, you know, and and the reason and the reason why, uh, you know, uh, just a little bit of of applause is because you, I, we just witnessed right now, you dive in to what's to your heart. As soon as you brought up your daughter and you wanted to make your daughter proud, bam, yeah, and it, and it hits you, and and it's amazing for you to say that. And for the people listening and watching that watch you, watch this hardcore dude, <laughs> veteran, that has a soft side to this. Yeah. And everybody does. Everybody has a soft side to, to it all because what is dear to our heart, right? Yep. So your daughter, and, and for you going back three times, yeah. was there a moment for you that you didn't know you were going to come home to your daughter? I mean, every day out there is a, every day is the unknown, bro. Every day you think of it, you know what I mean? Um, there's that chance. Uh, but, like, it's that, it's the, the dichotomy of, like, do I think of them or do I think of the job? And we try to focus more on the job than ever. And so um, by the time my third deployment, I already had three kids. You know what I'm saying? My, by my third deployment... So after that Iraq deployment, boom, I got to see my daughter being born, my, my second daughter, who's now 17. And then by my last deployment, my um, youngest, my 15-year-old currently is being born. And so at that point, you know, I think the biggest part of my life was I lost two of the biggest mentors in my life, but one of them who, who today still... Uh, has a profound, um, after my second deployment, I ended up uh, getting the opportunity to go to ranger school, right, work on that promotion. And so I ended up having to miss a deployment. Um, and this whole time, man, the first day I got to ranger battalion, you know, uh, you know, I was an athlete, you know, I felt like I was, a, I was, a, I was, a, I was in good shape, right? In my head, what I saw what Army Ranger would be was like what G.I. Joe's would be, right? Some dope ad, boom, 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 right? And uh, when I got there, like, it, I was like, man, these little dudes, these are little dudes. They're not like what I thought, these fucking, you know, these universal soldier-looking homies, right? And yeah. so I kind of felt like, man, this, these dudes don't look like badasses. They just look like little dudes who run fast. And then, boom, kicks out the door. This dude comes out with a cast on. He's a big-ass Hispanic bro, big-ass Latino bro, you know? And, and everyone's like, oh, Sean Barraza. And I was like, damn. That's a motherfucker right there, bro. <laughs> yeah. That's an army ranger, homie. Like yeah. shoulders in shape, confidence as fuck. He kicked in that door and everybody stopped, bro. Every he just demanded respect. He just like his aura was like Different. he ran shit, dog. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that dude's dope. You know what I mean? In that first deployment when I fucking I had to drop my shit, he's one of the dudes that was like working with me. And then there was something about him and me, bro. Like, he's a year younger than me, dog. But he's been there for so long. He's he's twenty years older than me in real life. You know what I'm saying? In, 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 in his soul, bro. His experience. Yeah. He's the 
he's the fucking the top dog, bro. You know what I mean? And and uh, so we we had this relationship, bro, where he'd be like, "Get your team, and I'll get my team." We played sports together and shit, and they'd always win because they cheat or some fucking bullshit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because they couldn't, they had to save face, right? It was just a thing, yeah. right? But but I loved him for everything. I loved how he was, and I wanted to emulate that dude. I wanted to be that dude when I when I grew up in the Ranger Battalion. And uh, and you know there was a there was a wedding, and we became friends that you weren't supposed to because like his rank and my rank didn't make sense. But I'm older than him, and he knew that, and we we just met, right? We I mean, yeah. we just we understood each other, and so we had these cool conversations and it's cool shit. You know what I mean? Like we were in Iraq, bro. I, I wrote this in my book that that uh. We're going door to door to door in a hallway and we got snipers taking out the lights because their night vision doesn't work with, with too much light. It fucks them up, you know? So there's one light's whiting us out, which means, you know, the, the, the lens goes from green to really bright and you can't see shit. And so he's like, fuck, where's the sniper at? But the angle, the sniper couldn't take it, you know? So I grabbed the rock and said, sorry, you mind if I throw it? And he goes, Psh, good luck, right? <laughs> Threw that motherfucker. And I was like, damn, way off, right? This bitch curved, pop, broke the light. We looked at each other like, damn, <laughs> and boom, yeah. and we ran and started doing our thing, bro, and it was these moments like that that I'll hold forever, right, because because before I went to Ranger School and they were going deployed, we played this football game, and, and I'm like, I'm about to win, dog, I'm about to win, right, we're close as fuck, and then somehow these motherfuckers pull it off, and he's talking shit, he goes, yeah, you thought you were going to get it, da, 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 right, and I'm like, man, fuck this, I'm out, and I started walking away, and he's like, Vargas, get over here, and I'm like, nah, I, you don't do that, but I'm, I'm so mad, and I'm like, nah, I'm out. And he goes, Vargas, get over here. And I was like, fuck. I turn around. And he's like, give me a hug. Yeah, and we get a hug, right? And he's like, good game. And he gets his hat and he takes his fucking ranger tab off. It's it's part of the uniform that we had. He, he cuts it off and he gives it to me. He says, go get your shit or don't come back at all. Right? And I was like, Roger, son. And I went to my room, bro. And I was like, damn, fuck that dude. I love you know, he's a dope-ass <laughs> motherfucker, right? Like, how, that energy was dope. He, yeah. he got his hat, took his shit off of it, direct, brrr, like it was fucking sewed on. Brrr, go get your shit or don't come back at all. But if that's not a challenge, then what is, homie? You know what I'm saying? You can even say, like, he did that in a sense where, like, he believed in you when you didn't even know he was actually believing in you. Bro. So, was, like, we talked about this, and it's about, like, bro, these these people that never even you think don't even know you that well, fucking give you a blind opportunity. Yeah. And it's one of those things where it's like, yo, motherfucker, I believe in you. I need you to believe in it too. Yeah. So go and do what you're set out to do. Yeah. And don't come back until you're done with it. Right? Yeah, it was uh it was powerful, bro. It was a powerful moment for me. Like, damn, that was that was dope. I feel like you found you found like a older brother love when this guy is younger Absolutely. than you. Absolutely. Absolutely. and that's humbling. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that was the last time I talked to him, dog. You know, I went to ranger school. I got injured in ranger school. I graduated, dis distinguished honor graduate, blah, 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 bing, bang, boom. I come home, but my shoulder's fucked up, right? I have a brachial plexus nerve damage, so the nerve in the whole arm is dead, so they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, authorize me to deploy. So I stayed back in the rear and uh, just doing all the tasks at, at there while they are doing their thing. About two weeks before they redeploy me and come home, um, he was killed on a mission, dog. And uh, Sorry about that, man. And that was uh, the biggest blow in my life, bro, because the the dude that was the best of the best um, was killed. And it puts things in perspective as, like, how vulnerable we are. The best dude we've ever had yeah. was able to get killed. And, uh, you know, I was in charge of... The <sighs> grabbing all his stuff and getting everything organized, and I... Received the bodies, and I did the uh, funeral processions. And uh, it stuck with me, dog. It's something I can't let go of. It's something I can't, I can't, I still to this day, I don't want to, bro. I don't want to heal that. I need, I want, I want to feel it every time because that's how significant he was in my life. And I've lived by his honor, and I've created everything I've created to this point out of doing everything I can to make him proud, dog. Like, if there is a heaven, he's looking down, like, go, bro, go. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's like, a, that's how I've been able to heal from it, dog. That's how, I, instead of fucking, for years I was in guilt, I was drinking, I wanted to fucking, I wanted to cause pain to myself to show him how much I'm hurt. 
I was drinking, just drinking, being like, if I died, he knows I'm drinking because of the pain that I feel that I don't have him in my world no more. And you realize fast, there's no fucking way that's what they want either, dog, you know? And when I was able to change that mindset, I realized, like, fuck, homie, if I died like this, those motherfuckers got me too the day he died. Mm -hmm. And so I... I pivoted, and I don't know what the fuck it was, but I said, I want to make this dude proud as fuck, and there's nothing stopping me, dog. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you here, and for those that are not just in the service, but that have had that one person in their life, right, that probably right now they don't realize that they're there for a reason, is what did your your brother teach you that you can give us and help out everybody else that that is yeah. listening to this you know i'd say he he didn't word it this way but it's the definition i've realized um was the essence of how he led leadership equals love leadership equals love and you lead because you love them and you you make these choices because you love them not because you're a tyrant, not because you're above them, not because you have the power, but good leadership rooted in love, dog. And everything he made, every choice he made was to make sure that we were safe and he was willing to sacrifice himself first. I love that, bro. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, it's... Um, I, everybody that, that watches you is seeing what, what you've created for for your veterans, you know, talking about statistics, you yeah. know, talking about depression, about suicide, talking about, you know, support systems. Yeah. Everything you're doing right now, even without personally knowing each other, I, besides this day, like, I know, and I know everybody here and everybody watching knows that your brother in arms is proud of you. Yeah. Because this is not the same person the same Rocco the same Vincent that was there in that in that deployment in that school in in that moment yeah you're a whole different person absolutely dog and how you said you're leading with with love yeah what's the most powerful thing that you can do if you lead with love that's what you're getting back and maybe you won't get any return from certain people but that's okay because maybe in their heart they haven't found that type of love and here, the way we've been leading, the way we are, it's like, man, even if I'm hurting, I still got to lead with this, bro. Because yep. if I lead with pain, then I'm going to self-destruct. Yep. That's, and that's a, that's a killer. That's self-sabotaging ourselves from yep. greatness. Like, I lost my brother last year. It was that same thing, bro. Found myself drinking. Mm -hmm. Just sad. Just, you know, like, bro, I want to I I let you know I'm hurting, bro. And I said, I still haven't moved on from it because I don't want to move on from it. Right now, not at all. Because yeah. why? That's the fuel that I have to yeah. hey, keep going. Mental health. Fortunately, he was part of a statistic of suicide. So what I'm doing, what we're doing is we're leading. And we're going to help out everybody else that is trying to find a voice. And we're being that right now. You're being that right now for your veterans, for your followers, for your fans, for the kids and guys and girls looking up to someone that has a story that that similar. Yeah. The people, what's the, what's one of the things that everybody said? Like, if you go to the army, it's because you lost. You're a lost soul, and you're over there. And, yeah. But it's sometimes that's maybe the case, but along the way, how you said, you find a fucking purpose. Absolutely. Finding your purpose is big. Yep. Right? What do you, what's your purpose that you have found? You know, it's, uh, it's obviously to serve. You know, I feel like the closest thing I can do to God be like God. My relationship with God is not like this Christianity, anything. Rich. I don't put a title to it. I feel like there's a higher power and I want to I want to live by uh, by by what I feel my conviction and that's to serve others, to help others find their path, right? Yeah. But I think all of it is the residual effects of how I love my kids, you know what I'm saying? I love them. I love my wife and I want to give them the best version of me all day. Yeah. And me doing that and putting that on display, the residual of that is what the world sees, and that's what they get, you know? So it's all rooted in their love. I love it. Now we're going we're gonna to pivot into this, right? The world <laughs> gets to know who Vincent Rocco is because he took a leap of faith and 
getting into something 360 out of the ordinary. Yeah. Writing, producing, acting. Yeah. How do you jump into that? <laughs> you go from an athlete to serving your country to now you're in, you're in the movie screen, you're in the TV screen. It's crazy, dog. It's crazy. So, like, uh, growing up in L.A., I see film and television, and, and it's cool. It's interesting, right? Mighty Ducks was dope. And I was like, man, those are my age, homie. I, I, could, be, I could do that, right? And, you know? But when you come from where we come from, there is no there's no segue to it, right? There's no one that has an answer on how to do it too, right? You you have to be somehow in the world of it to understand it. And so yeah. it was too far of a dream that I thought could I could even make a make a reality dog. But but because I couldn't read in junior college, I went to theater class. Coach was like, Yo, it's easy A. Go go to theater. <laughs> okay, go for so, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've known about yeah. those type of classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's like, all right, cool, cool. So I go to theater class and now um, you know, the first day of uh, of this improv class, the teacher says, who wants to, to, to do an improv about coming home drunk? I'm like, oh, shit, I do this all the time. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I raise my hand. You tell me twice. Yeah. What, what class was that? I think Dylan is perfect for <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right there too. Well, yeah, we've all we've all done it, right? So I was like, "Oh, I got this," and and I've never been kind of the shy type type. So I was like, "I'm down." So I get up and and you know I act like I'm trying to sneak in the door, and I got my keys in my pocket, and I'm shaking them, and I'm trying not to make noise. Blah blah blah. I drop my keys, and I'm like, "Oh shit!" You know, I'm doing all this just yeah, yeah, just, yeah. just thing, dog. And then I go and lay in the bed and and kind of go to sleep, and everyone's like, "Yeah," you know. And the teacher's like, "That was really good," you know. And then later on, he you know he he approaches me. He's like, "I really think you should should take a look at this, right? Like you should kind of take it serious." I'm like. I'm really just doing it for the A, you know what I mean? I'm trying, <laughs> you know, trying to play baseball, you know? Yeah. But that was probably the first step into like, man, that would be cool, right? It would be cool, right? Yeah. And then fast forward, you know, um, there's a big gap in my life that that we're skipping over, and which we, we need to, but we don't need to. It don't matter. But I was a Border Patrol agent, right? I did Border Patrol for seven years down in South Texas, right? And and, and for five of those years, I was a Special Operations Border Patrol agent. I was, I was part of a, a search, trauma rescue, search trauma and rescue team, dog. And so... Um, as I'm down there, I, I get transferred to like the top, top, it's called SOGs, um, um, special operations group, which is, we are the world response team in, in, in crazy shit, right? They call us, you know what I'm saying? And so as I'm doing that by chance, a homie of mine from Ranger Battalion, we did two deployments together. He's like, Hey, I'm making these funny videos and you're a funny motherfucker. Let's, let's do this, do this dog. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, bro, let's go, you know? So we make this first video, and the first video was like, uh, I believe the first video was something like how to be how to be a veteran, right? Something stupid, right? Just YouTube kind of thing. And fuck, boom, popped off, dude. Five million views, six million views. And he was like, we're selling shirts on the side, dude, and that's how we're doing it. And I'm like, cool, man, I'm in. Boom, they brought me on board. They gave me a small percentage of the company, and they're like, let's just keep making these videos. I'm doing that while I'm a federal agent, dog, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, let's just keep hustling this shit, dog. No one ever recognized you? <laughs> Bro, they did, bro, and and it was it, it became some interesting conversations. We're like all arrested, I, hey, bro. Yeah, like very strange. Like like we did these really uncomfortably honest yet edgy videos, dude. There's video yeah. like where my boy was dressed up in like kind of like trans, and we're all like, wait, what year was this? This is 2009. No, 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 no. 2000. 2012, 13, bro. And so... Oh, that's when shit was popping. Bro, so we... I mean, YouTube is killing it. <laughs> yeah. Killing it, right? And then we're, we're putting them on the Facebook and poof, we're getting millions of views and we're getting... We're selling shirts left and right. You put a video and then ping, ping, ping. People selling, buying shirts all day long and the shirts were edgy too, right? So we were like this crazy military comedy group. <laughs> and we made fun of ourselves. We made fun of exactly the lifestyle that everyone kind of knows. And so, like, yeah. you know, if you're deployed somewhere, sometimes everyone calls, they, they, they say, hey, she, she's a deployment 5 or deployment 10, right? Meaning, in real world, she's not rated a 10. But in deployment, she's a fucking 10, <laughs> right? So, I mean, so these very rude, yeah, 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 you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, like everyone, but everyone has a world like that, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Our world, drunk. right, right, right. <laughs> She's a two two a.m. ten, bro. Because yeah. this two a.m. bar's about to close, dog. We, be, you know, or we can be a two a.m. guys too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a two a.m. ten too. I'm sure back in the day, right? I'm like, yo, I'm gonna, if I go to Mexico, I become a ten all of a sudden. What's wrong you, with you? See what I'm saying? The bartender, so, the bartender looks at you like, hey, yo, you know, like, and all they look, you like, are you serious? He, he serves you, a, he serves you a double just so you can make it, you know. <laughs> Yeah, man. So we were making fun of we were making fun of ourselves. We were making fun of of post traumatic stress in a way that it was just like funny, right? Like, yeah. 
like someone shows up with a birthday party with balloons and it pops and we're all like, yo, ba 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 ba. You know what I mean? Like, just that's, crazy. That's, that's the thing about nowadays. Like, people, you can't do people that. People have yeah. dark humor nowadays. Some people understand it. Yeah. Some well, people understand dark humor. Some people too, just take it. Yeah, if it gets know? too big, all of a sudden you're a target. Yeah. You know, but yeah. back then it wasn't a thing. There wasn't this woke world. This wasn't, it wasn't like cancel yeah. culture. It didn't exist. But in our world, it was needed. Yeah. Right? So 20 years of fucking war, dog. We needed to be able to laugh at ourselves, dog. Mm-hmm. And so what we did at the time, we pretty much set the precedence for veteran entrepreneurs in the world on social media. We were the ones who fucking put, the, put that stamp down, dog. There was two other companies that were doing good, but we were the fucking young, exciting special operations motherfuckers doing it, dog. And we became successful at it. And at that time, man, paychecks were chasing, bro. I'm like, Border Patrol makes this much money? Ooh, business makes this much money, dog. And I was like, well, what's the choice? Well, I'm spending my time in front of a camera making good money, having a blast. I'm out there chasing fucking, you know, some bad dudes. Yeah. And one's a risk and one's not. I'm in the same cycle of missing my kids' birthdays. I'm in the same cycle of just working my ass off for the government. Same cycle of potentially putting myself in harm's way or have fun with my boys drinking beers and making videos. You know what I mean? So so it was really easy to make that choice at yeah. one point. And um, but for but for some though, for some yeah, because how, how you how you're saying like, you were when you're a part of a service for that long the way you were or even even if you're not a part for that much of a contract, you still find that sense of like yo I need this excitement I need no, this no, type sure. of so to let go of that is a big Dude, part it was, of it. It was I still had people like saying dog I can't believe you did that, I can't believe you. I was like bro. Me too. <laughs> you know what I mean? And there was there was moments, yeah. homie. Where it was moments. So so, my life ch- transitioned big time because I went through a divorce and I became the custodial parent for my four kids. Mm-hmm. So, single dad and four kids and running ops like that doesn't work, right? Oh. I had a girl in between. She was helping and everything. It was all good, but it wasn't the same. And I yeah. was like. Let's grow up already, bro. Let's be a dad. Let's do the right thing. I got a chance to do it. Let's yeah. do it, right? And so being in front of the camera, it sparked that, that man, I can do this. And then me and the homies were like, well, let's, um, let's make a movie, you know? Let's do a crowdfund. And we had such a big following at the time, bro. And we raised $1.5 million for a, for, a, for a movie, for an independent film. And we fucking produced our first film. And that was like, that was it. What, what was it called? It's called Range 15. <laughs> Homie, it is terrible. <laughs> I was just, bro, just the face he gave I'm like, yo. <laughs> I'm, okay, let me say this. Like, it is a cult classic in my world with darkest fucking humor you can think of. In our world, it was needed. Oh, yeah. In our world, it made yeah. sense. Anyone outside watching was like, ooh, turn this off. What the fuck is that? But, you know? but for you. For us yeah. at the time, it was necessary, dog. And then... And that and, was it. And I know there's so there's so much fucking to talk and, and knowledge in, in between this. But you are now and for how many years now you've been a part of Mayans? And how how did it come about? Yeah. How did yeah. it start there? Let's start about there. Because so, yeah. I watch Mayans and for I don't even know how to ride a motorcycle and I want to buy one. <laughs> yeah, and it started, and, yeah, and it started with like Sons of Anarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It started from there and I'm oh, like I watched Sons of Anarchy too. I was a fan too, bro. So, like, yeah. we did the movie, and that was the jumping point for me. I said, this is it, what I want to do. This Fuck what I want to do. I'm yeah. dropping everything. I stopped working with my dudes, right, for business, because I was following their dream. I was following their path, and it wasn't necessarily mine. It was cool. It was fun. It was making me money. But it was, if I stayed that path, I would have still been under their wing and doing their dream. Mine was this. And so I said, fuck, how do I do this? So I produced another short film. Just my, boom, 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 just wrote this thing. You know, I've I'm always been a writer, so I'm like, wrote this thing, like, let's do this, boom. And then I, I jumped on a, a YouTube skit comedy thing. It was like, dads, it's called Dads in Parks. You can find this on YouTube. It's actually pretty funny. But it's like two dudes watching their kids at the park playing, and we're just, we're just fucking ripping, dog. It's like no script. It's like, he's like, you're a big dude. I'm like, yeah, and, you know, and like, we just go back and forth. It was just improv. And it did so well that AMC bought another round of it, AMC movie theaters. And so they're like, hey, we want these before the movies. We want this before the previews. And so cool. I fly back to LA. I'm here. And I'm filming those. And my homie goes, hey, dude, Mayans is still auditioning for, for, for dudes for the show. I'm like, what? I said, I thought that was done for, homie. And there's no way I can get in that room. I don't even have an agent. I don't really have acting. I got a film I produced, right? I got three things yeah. I've produced, right? So Never acted. Right. I've never yeah, yeah. done the thing. But I felt... I, I'm confident as fuck I know what I'm doing. Yeah. But 
no one else knows who the fuck I am, so why would they pick me, right? So I told the homie, I said, I got my acting reel. I had all my shit, right? I had an acting reel. I had my head shots. I have, I have everything you need. Can you find the casting director? He goes, yeah, I know him. Let me make a call. I said, look, there's this dude. He looks perfect for you guys. Right? <laughs> he looks perfect for you guys. He's got a little bit of acting. Why don't you see what he does? She's like, okay. Boom. I got an email the next day. I got my first audition ever in Hollywood, homie. Me and my wife were like, um, I said, I said, how do you feel about this? She goes, do it. Why not? I'm like, okay, cool. Now, you know, I can't read, homie, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I've gone a long way in reading. I've, I've, I've improved my reading, but there's the anxiety of reading is still there. That's, you know um, that, that's me right yeah, there. Yeah, that, that's him. Like I, I, I fuck up my name, bro. My name starts with a D. Yeah. And sometimes I, I, I don't know what the fuck happens, but I do it in lowercase. And I put a B. Oh, bro. Yeah, I'm I don't just, know B's I'm and D's. I still don't know the motherfucker. Yes, bro. I capitalize I, them real quick, and I'm like, ooh, that's the D. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I have to be like, I'm Dylan or Dylan. Like, what the yeah, fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I know that, bro. So, so it's not that I don't have confidence in reading. It's the fact that I know I used to not read, and I know what that feels like. So other motherfuckers make fun of me. So I'm like, well, now I'm insecure about reading anyways. That's, yeah. that's, we, had a, we, we have like a, a side channel. <laughs> we have a vlog, and we have some questionnaires that we have to, to do. I, I literally have to like read it three times thoroughly to be able to. Once I, it's my turn, I'm be like, all right, I'm out. Yeah, I know yeah. I memorized this bitch. Yeah. Right. Hey, so what you do is it. last minute switch it on him. Yeah, <laughs> watch, no. the, watch the sweat come down. <laughs> no, because like even like at, at, at towards the end of the, of the pod, I always ask you know a quote of the day, right? Like leave yeah. us with a quote. He's like, I have something right. I'm like, no motherfucker, <laughs> off your top of your head. I, I wrote it down. I wrote it down. Even like we were with, with Mike uh, two weeks ago, he was like. Come on, motherfucker. Just just say it. And I was like, hell yeah, you got to say yeah. it sometimes. But we've always said it. Sometimes the most unscripted moments, like how we base this podcast, is is what leads into being it's, the most authentic. It's honesty, man. Right. So, yeah, bro. you're... you're <laughs> so I got in my first audition. So I'm reading it all night. I'm asking my wife to read it to me. Read this to me. Make sure I'm saying it right. right? I, I switch shit, right? I'm dyslexic, so things get twisted. And she's like, yeah, that's it. I was like, can you record it? So I had to record an audio for me, and I put it in my head, and I'm hearing her say it over and over and over and over. And my, my buddy was like, bro, be off book, which means don't look at the paper when you do your audition. Just memorize it. I'm like, okay, cool. Not a lot of lines, but there's an intimidation factor. Yeah. So I had my wife audio it for me, and I'm listening to it all night long, bro, for the next day, right? I shaved. I was drawing my hair out and shit, which is, it ain't, it ain't like it used to be dog so I was like fuck it shaved it off I looked like a straight up cholo dude when I showed up there right and I'm like I'm thinking like I want them to feel it homie I want them to look and be like yeah he looks the part okay you're good yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're good so I walk in and it's only the lady the casting director and I, f I did the whole thing and she gives me this big ass hug she gives me this big ass hug she goes it was great it was great and me and my wife were like I guess they tell that to everybody so fuck it we went home Right, we actually flew back to El Paso where we were living at the time, and uh, we were like, "Okay, well, that was fun. We tried." And then the next email goes, "Kurt Sutter now wants to see you," and I was like, "Shit!" At the time, I walked away from the homie, so there was no real money coming in the bank. Right, uh, we had that that whiskey company that was just just enough to kind of get by. And so I think I only had like 700 bucks in my account at the time, and the ticket was 450 bucks. And I told my wife, "Like, are we gonna risk it?" And she goes, "Why not?" Okay. Boom, flew right back. My dad took me this time. My dad's been riding motorcycles my whole life, dog. He rides for the Firehog, right? The the, the MC oh, for the yeah. LAFD, right? And so he, he's just like, oh, Vinny, this is going to be so awesome. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, whoa, 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 bro. I haven't even got it yet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking about my homie who, who, who helped me get into the door. He said, you've been a combat dog. The hardest thing, you've, you've, you've done the hardest thing. Walk in this room and act like you own the motherfucker, bro. Don't fucking sit there and be happy to meet them. Nothing. Do your job. Get the fuck out. Like, all right. So this time I have a, a serious character and a funny character, right? Two of them. And uh, I've been studying them all night. Same ass thing. Have my wife audio for me. Blah, blah, blah. Same process. I show up there and I, I do my scene for the first dude, right? And everyone's like, oh, okay. Now the next one. I'm like, okay. And I'm doing the scene of the funny one. And, and, and to be honest, dog, I blacked the fuck out. I don't remember. I remember coming to and everyone's like, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> Uh, they're like that was good I was like okay thank you and I shook hands and I walked out I was like fuck what happened what like, just happened, you know? like yeah. legit like I don't remember that piece right yeah. that 30 seconds or whatever it was, it was it's just whatever it was it worked so we're leaving dog and my dad's jumping on my back like Vinny that was so cool man I'm so proud of you that was so awesome I'm like yeah dad, we'll see we'll see Kurt Sutter was watching from the window and he saw my dad jumping on me and he saw the relationship we had and he was like something to the fact of that's some real shit 
and boom, I got the job. Here we are. Here we are, dog. It's actually six years later because we filmed the pilot first, and then the pilot, the first pilot, got thrown out, and we then we re, we reshot, they recasted, they kept me on board, boom, pilot two, and now we're going on season five. So I think that's something that we all don't know that like it's not just get the characters, get the get your storyline, and then boom on TV. Yeah, right. This is a six year process, oh, yeah. and Cuts have been made, addition like Bro, they've been adding, dude, they've dude, been taking. Dudes the, get killed every season, you know. Every script you get, you're like, oh god, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dying yet, you know. <laughs> I still got one more you season to go. Like, like, look, yeah. I'm not a Mayan, bro. I'm an actor, right? And currently, I'm playing a Mayan. That's gonna end soon, dog. When it does, I gotta find a new job. Mm-hmm. And that's just the, like that's how you have to see it. This is a business, dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? If, and if you get so wrapped in this that you think you're a Mayan, homie, I, I got some news for you, dog. That's not true. <laughs> the uh, I don't know his his I, it's it blew my mind. Jax from Jax Seven, Teller. Yeah, they, uh, uh, he he was Charlie Hunnam. Yeah, so him him on a video, he was talking about when he, when Sons of Anarchy ended, he would find himself going back to the set for months. Yeah, because he was like, I I became Jax. Yeah. And when Jax died, you know, a part of me died. Yeah. So, like, even, like, the security guard in charge of the set, you know, like, one, he was like, once you're done with the whole set, the thing is still there. So, he was like, I would drive, and the security guard like, yo, like, you guys are not filming anymore. What's going on? He was like, I, he was like, I understand. Yeah. Go ahead. So, I mean, there's just so much more than people even understand. This that has been my life, dog. Part of my ends, you're mm-hmm. in this the difference between your character and yourself, is there a difference? Yeah, there's a little difference. I, I, in in uh, in preparing for Gilly, there's something that's not Rocco. You know what I mean? But there's a lot of nuances that are, Jeez. right? It's, it's wow. Yeah, yeah, rookie see, move. Yeah, rookie there it move. Is. Oh, we're in a, <laughs> someone's getting fired today. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, so so if you had to separate the two, right? Everyone's everyone's like, oh, Gilly is so much like Rocco. In a sense, he is, and he, I think any character I play will always be a part of me, right? Yeah. Unless it's a, unless I'm playing something that I have to completely go out of character completely, right? But but for for Gilly, uh, in my prep work for him, you know, there was very little given to me in the first place because I wasn't meant to be what I'm in now. I wasn't meant to turn into a season regular. I was just a dude, you know, and Thanks. that. Yeah. yeah, I was a guy to pass the storyline. And acting is like, you just, just say the word to keep things going. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was an interesting figure. I looked a good part. I brought probably a little bit of authenticity to the look. And so that's what I was at first, you know. And then, you know, as I started to develop Gilly myself in, in preparation and like kind of acting work, right? You you, you prepare, you, you you have a process. Um, the difference between me and, and Gilly was Gilly needed the club, Gilly is the club is his dudes. The club is his war. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, I'm not like that. I don't need anything other than my kids and my wife. Right. But Gilly needs the club and he'll do anything for that club and dying for that club is honorable. Right. And so in that sense, he doesn't want anyone to fuck with that position. And so that's what Gilly is. Isn't, isn't that like full circle though? <laughs> right, like, I'm like, you're just saying, so, that, it, like, so it ain't hard to be that because yeah. that's who I probably would be if I stayed in war. Yeah, like you've already been a part of that type of yeah. club, so to say, yes. that now when you're playing this character that everybody has seen, yeah. we see the loyalty and the love that that person has for the club, that in reality it's like, yo, if you really hear who he is, yeah, you know that this is not just a character. This was actually a real life scenario. This that, is a version of me. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, you, you know, like, I'm not that dude anymore. Not that doesn't mean I can't be that dude. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, if shit goes down, I'm trained to do one thing: kicking the door and fuck people up. Right? I mean, that's like what, that's that's what I'm built for. Yeah. But that's a whole different side of me. But that's what Gilly is, right? Gilly is that. You know what I mean? So for you, is it sometimes is it crazy to wake up and be like, "Yo," um, or like to even to watch yourself on TV? Uh, I think I I'm good at separating it all. Mm. I don't care about it. I don't care about fame. I don't care about all this shit. I think it's a, it's a it's I care about, and I say that like I know if I got fired, I'd be like that sucks. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> but I, be I don't. <laughs> none of it is impressive to me. Uh, it's a challenge. I want to be great. 
because everything I do, I try and be great. Everything I've ever done, I try to be special operations of that. And so in the acting sense, I want to be great at this. I want to walk across that stage and my kids to look up and be proud, right? Yeah. So do, do your kids, do they watch the show? No, nah, bro, they're too young. My oldest one probably, like, she don't give a fuck. That, she don't you're, care about You're just dad. Yeah, bro. They, like, you know, there's nothing to them that's exciting unless I landed a kid's show that they watch, right? That would be exciting. You know, yeah. if I was blippy for some fucking reason. <laughs> I was just about to say blippy, bro. I was if I was blippy, my that. son would be like, yo, you know, but. It's funny because yesterday yeah. I was just watching Coco Mallet with Noah, yeah. and he was like, daddy, Coco Mallet, or baby shark. Baby baby, shark. Yeah, baby shark, right, <laughs> right. So I'm in the same phase as that with my kids, but. There's nothing about it that's impressive to them because it's like me being born as a twin. It's just what we do. And me as an actor is what they've seen me do for the yeah. past six, seven years of shit, you know? So um, I think it's always more interesting to their friends and to their friends' families. Uh, but I've also taught them, like, don't say what I do. If they ask, just say I'm a writer because that's not interesting to them. For me, that's the dopest thing in the world. But yeah. to other kids, it's like, oh, he's a writer. But when you start saying, oh, he's an actor, then like, oh, what? Oh, really? And it's it's an interesting topic to them. But for yeah. us, uh, and my goal of staying grounded with, with reality is like, it's a paycheck, dog. And I just want to enjoy how I make my money. And so I'm very blessed to be on Mayans because yeah. um, it's, a, it's a fun show to be a part of. Gave you different opportunities, for absolutely, sure. Absolutely, absolutely. And build relationships. So I, I am curious, right, because I am a fan of the show. Is there a certain person on that, on that cast that like, you got close to? Yeah, man. Coco, you know, Richard Cabral. That's one of my, the relationship's interesting now, homie, uh, to be honest, but like that's, that's a dude from day one we connected. There's a parallel between someone who's been to prison and someone who's been in the service and gone to war. Mm. There's, a, there's a parallel of the transition after, right? You lose your identity, you got to find your identity, you, you know, and then there's a dark humor that we all had. And so me and him, off the jump, was just perfect, bro. We just laughed and joked and fucking became homies. So that, I, I, I will still say that's one of my closest motherfuckers. I don't know if he'd reciprocate that. You know what I'm saying? Because after last season, um, you know, he's on his journey, bro. And he kind of, you know, yeah. he's on his journey. And, I don't, you know, and yeah. not to say I haven't tried. At the same time, I also don't want to disrespect his journey. That's his, dog. And, and, you know, right now, if I don't fit into that, so be it, right? It's all good. I don't, I'm not offended. My my wife and my kids are my circle anyways, but um, I definitely loved our time together. I definitely loved our relationship. I loved the humor on set, and I loved the challenges of, of acting with him. You know, there was this, it's a real beautiful thing about Coco, the character that was similar to a friend of mine in the military that was that was an addict. And a friend of mine in the military that was an addict, um, he, um, he OD'd, you know, he died. And, and, there was things I wish I said to him that I was able to say to Coco, mm. right? There was things that I wish I said to him because I didn't have the fucking balls to be like, yo, dog, you're fucked up, right? I, I couldn't. He was, a, he was a higher rank than me, right? As much as we're homies, I, I yeah. can't tell a higher rank. I'm like, bro, bro, you're fucking up, dog. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, like, when he died, I was like, damn, dog. Like, like, you, like w what was my place in that? I didn't know. But when I got to be Gilly and Coco, um, they, they made the dialogue a certain way. And I said, like, bro, this is beautiful because I get to fucking tell him. You know, and, and I got to fucking pull him. And, and there's an interesting thing about me and him, man. Like, like I said, like I, there's a lot of love, and that'll never change for me. I, I love the dude. I'll love him to the day I die. It's like one of my dudes. Uh, it's like a ride or die, uh, go to war with type dude. You know what I'm saying? I love yeah. him. Um, that 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 doesn't need to be reciprocated, homie. He could do whatever he feels for me is all good. I, don't, I have no um, no anger, no no resentment, nothing towards him, right? But the moments I've had on set with him will forever be uh, important for me in my career as a, my, as a develop as an actor, and the emotions that we had against each other were real, and, was, and which made it gorgeous. You that's, know what I mean? That's so dope. Yeah. What's have you had it in the army? You had it in the service where you're like life after this. Yeah. Have you thought about that now, or like even a, like, like a life after 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 acting? It could be life after acting, or it could be. A role that you've always wanted to play or you wanted, wanted yeah. to do, be a part of, what does that look like? What is the purpose of Vincent being a part of this type of industry? Yeah, man, you know, boom, dog. You know, we're, we're I, I'm a whole different person in life and what I want for myself. There's meaning and purpose. I wanted to, I saw the, the, I saw the influence that YouTube had created. 
For sure. I saw the lives that we changed and, and, and impacted and inspired. And I realize, like I think most of us know, is the biggest influencers in our life are social media, mainstream media. Mm-hmm. Whatever the message is, is what's influenced to our kids and to people. Everybody. And if I wanted to have a bigger message, I had to be in a place, in a position to do that. And so my journey is that. I don't think what I'm doing now, I think about what I can create 20 years from now. And in 20 years from now, I hope that I can shift the messaging in a way where veterans are not looked down upon or broken or or, or this fucking you know suicidal thing. But that's the minority, dog. What everyone thinks is the majority is false. It's the minority who struggle. The majority are successful as fuck, homie. But that, that don't create shares. That don't create likes. You know what I'm saying? So my goal in life as a writer, as a producer, as an actor, is to have a say in the messaging. And that will be more impactful and a ripple effect that can change ideologies forever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For sure. So that, it's, you just said it right now. Like It doesn't create likes or shares, right? But... At the same time, and if we think about it, right, because that's what me, Dylan, set out to do, and that's what, like, you know, Ashley is one of those that it's not really on camera either, but her impact on us is insane. Same way, like, how you just heard Jose say he's trying to mess around with it. There's impact that they have that's outside of a camera, but it's not, but it's, like, it doesn't matter to be on camera, right, to them. And what you just said right now is, like, you have, what the? Then the law? I think so. Uh, yeah, um, just take a 10. Stop dropping rope. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Are we on fire? <laughs> I'm uh, half of the building is, but we're not. <laughs> no, it's um, good. It's uh, what, we had, what we had said, and it's not, it's those people that are really impactful, but never cared about being on camera. Yeah. You cared about being on the platform to create a bigger message. Yeah. And you've, how you said, the minority have been very successful, but never had, either never had the opportunity or never cared for that, right? Yeah. You took this to a whole different level. Absolutely. You have a group mentorship, right? Yeah, I mentor 35 men currently right now. And the messages that you put out on TikTok, on Instagram, yeah. about the biggest one is the statistics. Yeah. I want you to talk about that because that is huge for, for those. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I, I mentor men and that's not like veterans only, but in my goal of like trying to help, I realize that veterans are no different than, than we are also civilians once we leave. And so in that thought process, like if we're civilians, well then we're all struggling, homie, right? Like, like this is yeah. a, the, the human condition is struggle. And so how do I help more people get through the struggle? And so when I started to identify that, you start looking at the statistic. Everyone talks about 22 a day, veterans, blah, 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 blah. And that was a very charming, charming and emotionally invested answer. Everybody has a bleeding heart for the suicide topic, right? And I get it. Like, we all should, right? It's, it, it hurts to hear it and hurts to see it. But what became a, the marketing strategy for the veteran community was like, let's talk about suicide. Let's, gain, let's get money to help suicide. Let's change suicide. But what we ended up doing was created a, full, uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's this study, right? So I'm all fucking going to college and all this shit, right? There's a study called Suicide Contagion. The more you talk about it, the more you create it. Right, but in the ideas of other people, the government of the military, right, and the military themselves, they were like, well, let's create a suicide prevention. Suicide prevention created more suicide, dog. And so it's like, what are we fucking doing, homie? Like, why are we promoting the most negative aspect of a veteran? Why is that the message we're leading with? No business in the fucking world says, hey, we actually fail this much. Nobody, dog. There's no business that that's the successful marketing, but it is for veterans. And you're wondering why there's so much issues in the veteran community because no one said, hey, dog, you can be successful as fuck. Hey, bro, check out this dude. He's a fucking multimillionaire. Hey, dude, not me. <laughs> hey, dude, like, like no one says let's highlight the successful fuckers so then we can follow their lead and see what they did. What's their blueprint to success? What did they do? No, we don't do that. Society instead goes, look at how bad it is. Look how much you're going to struggle. So every motherfucker getting out of the military feels the pressure of like, I might be a statistic. What the fuck? How was that the end? Well, none of us do that with our kids, right? None of us. None of us say, hey, you might be a statistic one day. You might commit suicide one day. What kind of fucking leadership is that, dog? 
No, we you're, tell them like you can do anything you put your fucking mind to. You can be great. You can be the best. Hard work. But that's not the message we give to our veterans. And so, so many fucking veterans who are vulnerable, who find themselves lost, say, mm, maybe I'm just supposed to be a statistic. What? We gave them that answer, dog. And so, like, why I decided to start mentoring, it's like, there's a lot of life coaches out there that don't have the life experiences I have. And I felt like I'm watching these dudes and I'm like, they're just not leading with love. They're not leading with love. They're leading with banks. Like, how can I, how can I make more money off these people? The world is lost. We know that. Everybody's looking for someone to fucking follow, dog. Yeah. Right? Because if you ain't have God in your heart, and it don't have to be the faith side of it, I'm saying in the sense of like, I have a relationship with a higher power and say, yo, here's my reason for being. Yeah. You're lost. Truth. And so then you, we, we, we run to the fucking, the loudest social media motherfucking influencer that has some kind of maybe relatability. And then you go, mm, I'll follow him. I'll buy his shirts. I'll take his supplements. I'll do ba 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 ba, right? And so now you have a bunch of fucking sheep running around, being just like some other motherfucker who's just as lost, but found a way to manipulate you to pay his fucking bills. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Fuck yeah. Go follow that dude, and will he lead you to the promised land, or he's gonna fucking, or all he was doing the whole time was manipulating you and marketing to you? I don't do that. I think that's fucked up. Yeah. So what I try and do is like come into my circle and let me show you. Here's the truth. If you're fucking struggling, look, 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 look. How are you going to combat suicide? Let's go there. You don't talk about suicide. You don't fucking bring suicide to the table. What's the crisis that leads to suicide is what we need to mitigate. What leads to suicide? Finances, relationships, um, addictions, fucking trauma. All these things that lead to suicide, how do we stop that? How do we teach people to have a better wellness of life? All around a good, healthy circle. Right, and as you're teaching them to fucking have better finances, if you teach them because you you've ever fucking struggled to pay your bill, homie, you know what that feels like. Yeah, oh, it feels like you can't breathe, dog. There's no way to turn, bro. There's no yeah. relief from that fucking cloud chasing your ass on your bills, dog. I know that, bro. I've been that. Have you ever been in an unhealthy relationship where you feel like there's no getting out of that shit? Where you're like, bro, this is gonna fucking end me, homie. I mean, I, I don't want to deal with this shit no more, dog. Yeah. You ever fucking been an addict and say, fuck it, let's keep drinking. Hopefully I fucking die tonight because then I don't want to face tomorrow. You ever had a dream that haunted you so bad that you just didn't want to fucking face it again? We are human as fuck and all struggle the same fucking way. And we all sit in our bubble thinking no one knows what this feels like. That's fucking a lie, dog. That's depression telling you it's a lie. You're not alone. We all feel this. We all go through this shit. We're all living in the human condition trying to find a way to be fucking happy. But everyone's avoiding the truth of like, part of it is accountability of my own actions and how do I fix that? So we focus on suicide instead of focus on mitigating the, the, the potential stressors and the things that can lead to crisis. So what I do is I fucking go to the baseline of what, cri what leads to crisis and I start healing that. Let's fix your mental health. Let's find all the different modalities of healing. Let's, let's debrief stress. Let's deconstruct trauma, right? And once you're done fucking doing that, let's get to the hormones. Are your hormones balanced? Let's get blood work done. Let's check that. And when that's fucking good, let's figure out your finances. Let's get down to the nitty gritty and how you can save money and actually feel comfortable. You can breathe again. Let's, let's show you how to have a healthy relationship, dog. Let's show you how to actually communicate with your significant other because men and women tend to just think so fucking different. And my wife has taught me so much of that, right? right? And let's, let's find the healthiness, this, this circle of healthy that like if you do find yourself in crisis in one of these spaces, well, you've already built such a strong foundation that the resiliency of that is like, I can deal with this. Yeah. I can face this shit. Because we, like, life is nothing but you're going to go through hard shit. Like, if you can't acknowledge that, bro, you're fucking, you're in trouble. Yeah. Because life is hard, whether you like it or not, whether it's self-induced or just the reality of it. People die. People backstab. You know, shit happens, right? And so if you can't come to terms like, this is life and that's okay, I've already have some plays in, in, I have some things in play that can protect me from this. I can accept, like, shit happens, uh, and, and, and that, if you, can, if you can do these things, if you can mitigate crisis, you will stop and slow down suicide. And that's what I do. Damn. That is, that is a dude that figured out his purpose. That is a dude that is leading with love. That is a dude that with everything that's going wrong with the world, you're finding the answers and trying to help out somebody else. 
how you said, there, we all got fucking issues. Yep. There's answers to it, but it's, are you ready for the answers for it? Because you're going to, man, I'm depressed. All right, bro. What, like, what's going on, though? Yep. Nah, bro, you're not going to understand, though. <laughs> well, I'm not if you don't tell me. Yeah, exactly. But it's just like we've all had we've parents that maybe are not there. We've yeah. all had people, relationships that didn't work out. We've all been through breakups. We've all been broke. We've all been this, this, this. Everybody, it's the, it's the world. same, homie. Yeah. We're all the same. Yeah, so it's just about, hey, can you communicate? Can you, if there's Right. A, there's can, can you define what that is, right? I tell, that's what I ask dudes. It's exactly what I do. So, do, like, a lot of veterans use the term demons, right? They, they, it's just, and I use the veterans because those are the guys that talk to me more than anything. And, and I have a lot of law enforcement officers. And, and then now I'm starting to have a, I'm ha starting to have a lot of just men that get it, right? They're like, oh, this dude sees me. Like, I see you, dog. Yeah. I see it, right? And so they all go like, so if they use the term demons, I'm like, the demons, bro. And I'm like, okay, cool. Define your demon. Yours. Define yours, right? Whatever that name is, tell me what it is. And then dudes going to be like, um... Like a lot of guys overseas that that same as me that struggle with like the 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 residual effects and, and and the the collateral damage that happens overseas. It's usually kids, right? That's hard, bro. That's a hard one because when you have kids, then you still feel really really guilty that you've seen kids get hurt. Yeah. So a lot of the guys that come to me that have that, it's like okay, I I know that I have that same demon, and so here's here's what I do. Right? Here's what I've done. Right? Here's the list of things we can do to. Have, find a way to get to acceptance, right? Because you have to get to acceptance, right? Like, like death in the point you'd be like, accept it. Now, if you're someone who follows God, then you're like, well, this life is on, only just a, a, a moment until you get to the afterlife, right? Because if you're someone who, who believes in some kind of Christianity, we're all trying to get to heaven, right? In, in that sense. Yeah. So if you're trying to get to heaven, what are you mad at? Yeah. They're where you're trying to get to, right? So they're good. So, they're good. so now you got to get over you. You got to get over your ego. You got to get over everything that's going on in your set and be like, yo, they're, they're where they need to be. They're where they want to be. They're where they're trying to get to. And we're just trying to live a grateful, uh, a righteous life to get there too. So you can't be mad anymore. You have to accept if you believe in God, then there's no anger. If you believe in God, say, this is part of life. Because yeah. this is just like we're just in a, in a being waiting to get there, right? If you don't believe in God, then what are you mad at? Because then we're just fucking humans in the spinning rock and fucking we're just waiting our, wasting, waiting our time. Yeah. So there's no reason to ever re really be mad. We just got to accept. Yeah. I think like, you see what when, I'm saying? When people find the reason to be mad, it's just like they just want to be mad. No, no, for sure. Yeah. Because, like, because they don't so know how to define what that pain is. Yeah. Like you, when someone's mad at seven in the morning, it's like, bro, you just fucking woke up. What's wrong? Yeah. Like, let's talk about this, right? And, right. And, and we mean they don't always have these type of conversations. And it's just like, bro, like we're going through this. Or we just had an interaction with this type of person. And it's like, bro, like. If the person is so bad to you, why are you there? Mm. You know what I mean? I learn how to let go. As much as it hurts, right. as much as you feel like you may not survive without it, like, hey, wake up tomorrow, bro. You're, you'll, you'll be all right. Yeah. But it's just acknowledging, like, hey, were you not valued? Are you being mistreated? Or are you being unfulfilled in some sort of way, right? Because yeah. then all that leads into... He did, she did. It all leads into heartbreak and and it's hell it, resentment and hell resentment. Hurt people, hurt people, bro. I feel like you just you just want to be you just want to blame someone instead of yourself. Bro. Right? No, exactly. Nobody wants to take take credit, but as also they just don't want to believe that someone could do that to them. Like, well, they did. And then what are you you gonna hold yeah. that resentment? Because like a, like the term I said, hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. Right. That alone is like, so if you hold resentment, you're just gonna end up putting resentment onto someone. It's gonna it's gonna come out. It's gonna project itself some way. Whether in your drinking, whether your anger towards someone else, whatever it is, it's coming out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, and it's never good. It's that um I think we're we're all the same, like, all right, I'm fucking mad. Dude. I think we're all the same in the answer, like, okay, why? Yeah. Nah, bro, you you don't you won't understand. It's like try me. Try yeah. Me. Then, it's, let's talk about this, yeah, bro. It's like, like my, my my daughter gets all mad at me and shit because I'm like 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 we try and make, as parents, you try and make good decisions for them. Yeah. Now you also have to find the balance of letting them fuck that up too. Yeah. But as I'm like, hey, I think you should do this. She gets all that, dad, blah, 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 blah. You try to be controlling. I was like, no, but I just know where you're going. I know what this can do. And I'm trying to save you from that pain. But if you want to fall on that on yourself, that's fine too. Because I'll be on the backstop waiting for you to fucking come up. You know what I'm like, that's, dad. That's, that's the thing. I mean, I'm obviously younger than you guys. Yeah. Don't make me feel old, fool. I mean, yeah, I you. Right, you know, but I, damn, calling me real. Old, <laughs> no, it's like damn. Fool. Um, but I've had a lot of people tell me that I mean, are older than me that have gone through life. You'll take it this way. 
if you do it this way, it'll come out this way. Consequences yeah. are this, consequences are that. But is it different? I feel like I know I know that you've gone through that. I know that that was your consequence, but what does that promise me that will be my consequence? Oh, absolutely not. And I right. don't blame the people that take those those decisions because it's like everyone has their own, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's like you don't learn until you experience it yourself. Absolutely. And then you mature and you realize, you know what? You were right, bro. Some, someone said it that I can't take your advice when I know you've never gone through it. Yeah. And – I know I'm I'm like that, and I've heard other other men be the same. Like, yo, you can't tell me how to be a millionaire if you've never even had a million dollars. Absolutely, right? How do you, how are you gonna tell me how to be happy when you don't even know what happiness is? Right, right? Or true love, or how do, how does a relationship work when you're single and you're still trying to find yeah. somebody? It's like it's like the fat personal trainer. Oh. Oh, uh, I'm just, oh, I'm just saying, oh. Yeah, uh, hey, I'm just saying, right? Yeah, no, that's a, right. That's actually yeah. pretty good. You go to the gym, and you're like, look, he might have been sometime, but he's yeah. not now. Yeah. And, 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 he might, my times, and, and so it's this thing. It's this thing where, like, I'm like, mm, I'm good. I'll, I'll do my. I'll, I'll go to the dude who's ripped because I want to ask what he's doing and how he's staying there. Yeah. Right? But it's the, that's the same exact thing. Like, how are you going to learn how to how to go to war from someone who's never been to war? Right. Yeah. How are you going to understand how to get over divorce if you've never been divorced? Right. It's it's the same thing. Yeah. And so, like, I feel like I've gone through a, a pretty full spectrum of life, dog. You know what I mean? To be able to give back and be like, well, here's what I learned. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And. And, and I still don't have the answers. And I can tell you that, right? Because leadership is love. And love to me is like being honest and saying, I don't know everything, but I know a lot of things. Yeah. And in these things, here's how I'd handle it. And as of now, we're doing all right. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's being realistic with yourself. Yeah. And as much as I want to help out everybody in the world, I can only tell you so much for what I've been through. I, don't, I, I can't tell you about... Poverty, bro. My, my parents were, were hard workers. They, they led with, with love and, and, and wanted the best for us. But I could tell you how I felt when I was broke mm -hmm. or how it feels to not have anything to your name and having a baby on the way and you got to strap up just so you can go and get this, yep. get this done. I could tell you about that. Or now I could tell you about how to push yourself to the limits and how it feels to run into a wall when you feel like no one understands you. And then when you realize, like, man, I'm just doing it to myself now. Yeah, you know, and and Dylan has always told me like, because there was we we went to go eat, and then when we left, you know, my son was in uh, was in Mexico with his mom, and he he's hearing my son just talking to me about daddy about buying a horse, but he doesn't want a horse because he doesn't he wants to buy toys still because his mom was like, if we buy you a horse, you can't have toys. No, 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 never mind, <laughs> toys. And I'm talking to him, and then Dylan was like, <laughs> like this. It wasn't that he was in a verge of crying, but he was just like. Damn, bro, I don't know what that feels like, you know, having a little man talk to you like that. Mm -hmm. I was like, it's different. Yeah, It's a lot different because I could, how you were saying about your daughter, I was like, I want my son, when he gets to the age, to be like, I'm so proud of you. You know, even like I tell my dad now, my dad, his dad was Hispanic, Mexican, hard, mm -hmm. that, 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 that didn't show him that love. And I didn't even know who he was. You know, things happen. And I tell my dad I'm proud of him. And my dad's just like, I just do it for you guys, man. I'm just like, That's stop, cool. fool. I'm just like, don't That's do this. It. <laughs> but it's just my... I don't think I've ever told my dad that. Yeah, like, my my dad's never... We we had our issues. I'm not going to sit here and be like, man, we've been had a perfect, tight relationship. Nah, man, there was there was some nights where me and him were, were not eye to eye, and yeah. and he's never known how to love. He, yeah. he wasn't taught that, bro. I He wasn't taught that. And I tell my mom now, like, hey, like, my dad was the second oldest. He became a second dad mm -hmm. to all his brothers and sisters that have issues on their own. That's, that's up to them. But when me and my dad have gotten into it, like there was one time clearly, and I, always, and I talk about this, that we were going to get into it, right? I put my son in the truck, and he's just mad for whatever reason. And we had gotten into it already because I have his temper. Yeah, I have temper where when we're both going to go at it, yeah. You're the head honcho? Okay, I'm a dad too, man. I'm yeah. a head honcho too. Yeah, I'm a grown-ass man too. Yeah, like, oh, we're not a little kid anymore. And he, I was about to leave, and I said bye to my mom. My mom was already knowing, and he's like, yeah. And then I just, I just hug him. Yeah. He's like, I'm, I was like, I'm sorry. I love you. Just started crying. Yeah. He was like, I love you too. He said, Te quiero mucho. I'm like, damn. And I'm like, but that's what happens when you take one more second. 
yeah one more minute to really think about what can come from this oh yeah and he he's always told me and he tells like hey are, are you happy working i was like bro you know how much i take into like in me that i'm so proud that i'm able to work with you and for you yeah and i tell her it was like oh that's your dad's business bro you're next in line no bro that's his bro i'm living his dream because he's always wanted to he set out to do this yeah he did it and now his kid his son his only son is working with him and growing it but i tell her i was like yo i created this because now this is my baby yeah my dad created the blueprint to what it what it was to build something and I tell him, I was like, you created that. And I'm gonna support you, and I'm gonna love you, and I'm gonna and I'm I'm gonna do it as much as I can. But I gotta do this. This is my purpose. This is where I know I can change a lot of people and help people. As much as and people don't understand this, as much as this helps them when they hear it, this is our free therapy to ourselves, Absolutely. to myself. That when I'm done here, when we're done here, we're gonna go drive back, go eat, whatever, and we're just like. Man, I feel good now. That's you know cool. what I mean. So hey, I hope this podcast is good for you. I don't even know. Like, oh, this is more. This is, I'm this just talking over here. This is what we need. We're good. <laughs> Call me. Like, <laughs> Let me talk about my sentimientos right now, eh? Guerra, mi fool. Eat some hot Cheetos, eh? Ashley, you bring the hot Cheetos? Didn't really buy oh, hot, I Cheetos. hot Cheetos. Bro. He brought hot Cheetos. We're good. I get hungry like every five minutes. So let's pivot. Yeah, this is this is where we're gonna make everybody cry. Hopefully, uh -oh. make you cry. I don't even know uh, where are we going there. Damn, I thought we, I thought <laughs> I thought we, we been were there, dog. That, yeah. I thought we've been there. You have gone through transitions in your life. Yeah, from being a twin mm -hmm. to going to college, going pursuing a dream, the dream not not going and, and not working out, to finding a set of a part of your life that. You found your purpose in living mm. that transition, and now you are on a platform and in in the industry where millions of people watch you. Yeah. The transitions. How do you maneuver? How do you look back at who Vincent was throughout those times and who Vincent is now? Mm-mm. Um look, dog, like I, I think Early on in my life, I was trying to be something for them, for people. I wanted to entertain them. I wanted to be the funny guy. I was known as the party guy. I was trying to do things for other people. I, I stopped chasing that, like, many years ago. I think, you know, my time in the Border Patrol was probably the most grounding time of my life because you really, like, that, that's a... It's a crazy job, dog. And there's a lot of controversy of that that job. And being Latino and doing that job was even more like I still get shit on for that. And it's like, they don't get it, right? I, I stopped trying to be something for everyone else and realized, like, this is, this is all a game, bro. This is like, I don't need to please nobody. And so as I get into this, this whole thing of fame and, and then continuing... Um, I stayed grounded by one thing, and like I said before, and it's it's probably going to be repetitive, but like to be good for my kids and be good to my wife, and and make sure that circle thrives, right? Like, like like I said before, like I don't give a fuck about anybody who's not in this circle more. This is everything. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, we can have a relationship, we can be homies, but if at any point you pull try and pull me from this circle, you're out fuck off you know what i'm saying and that's everything Thanks. if mines asked me to hey we need you to be a year over here no nah, i'm good it nothing is going to be in nothing's going to get away in front of this i will walk away from the entertainment space if it threatens this this isn't like i don't i don't, I don't chase this thing dog like a lot of people come to la trying to be this trying to be like i want to be an actor i want to be famous i want to make money and i'm gonna tell you none of that is make none of that equals happiness Excuse me. None of that equals happiness. None of that means content, right? None of that means your family is healthy emotionally, physically, mentally. Boom. None of it. Mm -hmm. So at any point when this becomes toxic to that circle, I'm out. Fuck all that. I can make money anyway, dog. I can make money anyway. I can fucking work at McDonald's. I can fucking work at Walmart. I can do anything to make enough money for the family to be comfortable because happiness is not money. When people start chasing that shit, they realize real fast they fucked up. They lost who they were. They lost who they are. And when you do that, 
Bro, and then you're in search for a fucking happiness, and you're never going to find it there, dog. And so I realized throughout all this shit I've been through, I've found happiness in all these crazy moments. And right now in my life, happiness is not the fact that you see me on TV. That does not equate to happiness. That does not make me feel good. It's cool to inspire. It's cool to, to motivate. It's cool to, to, to be a beacon for some people. But I don't do it for no one other than my kids. And so, if, like I said, for the residual effects of that is that I've inspired you. Cool. Yeah. But it ain't for you, dog. It's for them kids. So you stop serving others to serve yourself and your people. Which inadvertently serves others. Yeah. Because what I do. It's, Chris, he's, the, he's told us the first time we're in San Diego, it, it's like a life jacket, right? Say the plane crashes and everybody's in the water. You're trying to save everybody, but if you don't put the life jacket on yourself first, Absolutely. you're going to drown, and you're only going to help out a certain amount of people that you won't get to mm -hmm. the 10 other people that need your help. Yeah. So when he said that, I was like, yo, and, and we've been saying that, like, yo, and I tell him all the time, it's like, bro, like, if we don't take care of our own issues, our own self, and care about us, how the hell can we be here and try to help 10, 30 other people right. without, like, I'm going to tell you, like, what's the... I'm going to give you the best advice, but I just can't take it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's right. like, mm. True. yeah, do what I say, not what I do. Yeah. Hmm? What? <laughs> Bro, in, in my world right now, like, like, the only reason I feel like I'm in a position where I can mentor others is that I've been doing this in and out for six, seven years, and it's still working. Right? You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay, <laughs> full, so, you know, okay, <laughs> cool. So this works, right? Like, because yeah. I don't know if it works, right? Like, my, my relationship with my wife is, is, is incredible when we first met. I was like, well, I hope the fuck this works, right? You know what I mean? And as it continues to work, I'm like, man, we, we, we're getting it. And, and we continue to nurture it, right? I nurture everything. I still nurture my kids. I nurture my wife in our relationship. I nurture my fitness. I nurture my mental health. I'm always in maintenance mode, right? I'm always in maintenance mode, making sure it's still good. You know, the oil change has to keep <laughs> happening. Yeah. But in that sense, like, I'm always scared, like, what's coming, dog? Like, someone's going to try come and try and wipe me off my feet. But I'm grounded, and my kids understand who I am. My wife gets it, so we're good. Right? COVID hit. What I do? I got a job. Fuck it. Remember the interview? They're like, aren't you on Mayans? Mm. I'm like, I am. <laughs> and we're not working right now. Yeah. So I'm willing to pick up piss from a fucking addiction clinic just to keep the lights on. And it's all good, dog. Because I'm grounded. I don't give a fuck. I'm not embarrassed by that. I, I, I would have worked anywhere, dog. And so with that is like, that. that's for me to know, like, as in the sense of, all of this is bullshit. It doesn't mean anything. Right now, it's how I make my money because I would love the dream to be able to help influence the messaging and continue to keep the lights on for the family and continue to be a big part of their lives. But like I said, at any point, if it starts to ruin this circle, I'm out. Fuck all this. This is worth it. Followers on, on Instagram and, and all this stuff is worthless if there's not grounded, if you're not grounded, right? The bigger your podcast gets, if you don't stay grounded, your podcast is going to go a whole different direction. Yeah. Yeah. Your podcast will change because you start fucking wanting to conform what everyone else is fucking trying to push to you. Yeah. And if you let it get to there, you're going to find yourself and be like, this is nowhere where I wanted to be. Yeah, I think we when we did like a sidewalk talk, we, 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 it was a fun day, right? We podcasted, we had fun. And then we're like, all right, let's get out of the comfort zone. Let's go do a sidewalk talk. Let's go up to random people, ask them a question. Yeah. And then everybody there, I mean, we're just kind of back and forth. And then one of them had like, yo, like, ask them fun questions. I'm like, what is fun? What's a fun question? And I promise you that was like the most uncomfortable conversations I was having. Because <laughs> it was just like, so what are you doing here? Okay, we finished, right? We did like four people. And yeah. then it was just like, we finished now, like. Yo, the, I, to me, I know that wasn't me, and it wasn't good. It didn't feel good. A couple of weeks later, we went back, and and we we're like, you know what? Let's go do what we do best. When it has, yo, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. What's your definition of happiness? Boom. Mm. Bam. That felt good. That felt yeah. amazing. Yeah, if you're feeding the circus, dog, you become an act. You know say what I'm it, saying? Say you better say it. You know what I'm saying? Detain the clown, you become part of the circus. Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> oh, there you go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's for, for the YouTube time of my life, I was nothing but a monkey, and you're serving me peanuts, homie. I'm, I'm, I'm a gimmick for you. And you wake up every day, and you're someone else's gimmick, and you're not true to yourself. You're not happy, dog. Yeah. You'll never be happy. I, and, and, and in that sense, where so many people are living because of what other people want them to be, they've lost who they root of who they are. Right. And nice. then when you do that, you wake up in the mirror one day and you don't recognize yourself. 
And that's not happiness, dog. Yeah. No, it, you have it. to be true to you. You have to be true to you. So many people ask me, like, bro, let's go. I want to see more of that skit comedy from YouTube. I just, I love that. And it's like, bro, I've lost the heart for it because that's not where I'm at right now. Yeah. I have grown. I have grown so much and maybe away from some of the closest motherfuckers I've ever had in life to get to where I'm at now. And so those relationships are not as good as they used to be, but I don't give a fuck. My family's good. That circle's right. So we're good. I'm in the best, healthiest position I've ever been, and that meant I had to leave some people behind. I've grown past them. I wouldn't say above them or, or anything. I've just grown in a different direction because I say if I grow past them in a sense where like I've grown above them, like that's, that's fucking rude as fuck to say because their journey's theirs and mine is mine. I've just grown in a direction where I'm most comfortable and happy, right? And, and, and in doing that, like, bro, I've found my way and who I am. I know who the fuck I am. I know exactly what the fuck my purpose is. I know why I'm here. I know why I do what I do. I know my why. You know what I'm saying? And as long as I stay in that circle, right, that's, I'm going to be in a healthy space. And that is like where I've found like, I talk to dudes all the time. I see them do the gimmicks, right? I see them do the social media gimmicks and yeah. I've been there and I've done that. I'm like, yo, dog, um, one day that's going to get exhausting. Mm. And when it does, you better know who the fuck you are. Yeah. Because, yeah. because look at, look at like a, um, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off right there, bro, but, but Jim Carrey. He says for so many years he was living for everyone else. He was being the character they wanted him to be. He didn't know who the fuck he was at one point, bro. Yeah. He lost himself, dog. And that is what's a scary thing to get to. You 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 have to know, you know, I'm a, I'm a paid actor, dog. I played Gilly. And when Gilly's off, I'm gone. I'm Vince. Right? I'm Rocco, what everyone likes to call me, right? Yeah. And Rocco is just a real ass dude, bro. Just a dad who's done shit, right? Yeah, fucked that's, it up and figured it out. <laughs> that's live life. And that's a part of it all. We Live life, we learn, and to grow as a person, you got to learn through all the fucking mistakes. That's it. Through all all the highs and lows, you still there's always a lesson, right? You lose a person, don't lose a lesson. Chris said it best. You know, you go through events, learn from it. That there's, I think Pitbull has said it like, there's never losses, there's only lessons. Yeah. And I'm like, hell yeah! So I try to portray that with everybody we talk to. He also, he also said, "Thumbin, thumbin's gasoline or whatever the fuck." <laughs> <laughs> That shit takes offensive. Oh, 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 my bad, my bad, my bad. I don't know. I don't know. My mom's yeah, a big Pitbull fan. I don't she know. was like, that's not Pitbull. Oh, okay, my bad. Right Who uh, was that? Daddy Yankee. Oh, my shit. Oh, my same bad. Genre, same genre. I'm going to get yelled at for that one, dog. She's already like, dude, hey. t- you better cut that shit off. Yeah. <laughs> no, but so with with everything in life, right, That that's the thing that the purpose of this this episode here and what the conversation has gone through is – you're not stuck to just one no. one chapter of your life. There is a book, you know, you wrote a book. There's a there's a book that everybody has and that's their own. Yes. Right? There's every fuck it's not just one chapter like, you know, Dr. Seuss books, Green Eggs and Ham and Sam I Am and Done. Mm. No, bro, it's chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, yes. 5, the intro, the outro, everything. Yes. Right now, it's still being fucking written. We talked about, like, bro, we didn't know that in a year we would be sitting fucking here. Like, we're about to end 2022, and we're ending it with a big bang. And we're just like, man, did yeah. we expect this? No, bro. I'm like, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> we didn't. And I didn't expect where I'm at, too, dog. Right? Like, I didn't expect that either. Right? Yeah. So, it, it's taking the blessings, and even sometimes they come so in disguise that, you know, we... We didn't know that not showing up to that place, you know, gave us this still, right? Yeah. So, you know, being at the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, you were in deployment. Yeah. Not going to a certain mission saved your life. Absolutely, bro. And me me not, me not getting injured in ranger school, I wasn't on that mission that day. I lost my mentor. Mm-hmm. Crazy as fuck. And you're here. Yeah. You're here writing your story, being a dad, being a husband, and being one of the most influential veterans, husbands, dads, actor, producer, whatever you want to call yourself, label yourself, you're being the best you. Mm. That's something that no one can ever take away from you because, and that's something that as much as we tell you we're proud of you, you have to be able to tell yourself, I am proud of Vince. I'm proud of Rocco. Yeah. Because it's not the high school Rocco. It is not the college one. It's not the army one. It is the dad and the father that is now that's doing everything possible to protect that circle that means the world. You're you're a famous person. For somebody to say you can give that up to to keep your circle, 
everybody, what the fuck? Why, bro? Why? And some of the most broken people are the ones that are leading. Yeah. Right? We talked about longevity. Mm-hmm. It's not just one year, we did our thing, let's get paid, and let's leave. I call it the slow burn, bro. There's there's slow a lot burn. of people that come out with mental health years later in the industry that are leading a whole millions of people. But how can you lead someone when you're so broken? You know, not being able to have the platform to be yourself. Yeah. Why would you do that? How can you do that? I tell everybody, it's like, yo, it's a Toast to Life podcast. But why did you, bro, I love drinking and I love talking to my people to an extent, right? Yeah. To an extent. But and I tell them, like, oh, you know, I don't like being sentimental. I was like, bro, tell me you've never had a moment in your life where you're at a party with your homeboys, you're dr- drinking hand, and you're out to the side and then you start telling about everything. Yeah. I'm like, tell me you can get that, that moment back. Nah, bro, I don't remember it. There you go. There you go. And that conversation is what what, ha- what helped you get through that night and that day. Yeah. And we just did it. Like, someone's like, yo, like, you know, maybe you should switch it up, bro. Take out the sad music. And I was like, nah. Nah. No. I was like, think about, like, do you, is your platform ready for you to talk that way? Yeah. <sighs> is it? No, it's not. But mine is. Yeah. And we're creating a safe space. Yeah. You leave here, you have a safe space to be yourself and to cry, to talk, let everything out. And then when you leave here, I want I want this to feel like a, a release. Like, all right, man, I feel really good about this. I feel good about what I just said. And I feel good when I see these messages be out there for the world to see and seeing the comments of how many people I'm helping and relating with. That is why I've been through this. That's why I'm still here. That's why I'm still alive. Mm. You know, Dylan has, has been been on the camera recently with with us and he the people when when we put messages that he said like there's a lot of people that resonate i'm like yo like get a little bit more comfortable you have a story you're able to talk you're able to tell it that's why she hates me when i put her on camera and everything (laughs) you know jose's the same way and everybody that we have around us is like yo like you don't gotta be famous to be impactful no you just have to have a voice and be ready to use it so whenever your time comes to Speak your mind, say it. So we went on a podcast, and I was like, yo, I'm so sorry for being, you know, so high energetic and being motivational, but that's just where I'm at, bro. Like, I'm telling you how I am and where I'm at. It's not just a turn-on switch. Yeah. It's, we're on. And, yeah, some days we have our fucking moments. I don't want to be, I want to be an introvert today. Yeah. And then the first interaction happens, and, nah, we're good, bro. Let, Let me give you that energy that you need and you deserve. Like, we're in a position where we can we can maneuver whatever way we want. We're we're adults, we're humans. You know, I just had a kid yesterday tell me that her mom doesn't talk to her anymore and she has to find a place to live. A high school kid. Yeah. That is That's heavy. That's heavy. And I was she was like, I may not be able to 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 play. And I'm like, we're gonna figure it out. Yep. Don't worry about that. You gotta work, okay, cool. We're gonna figure this out. Don't lose what you work so hard for. Where this might give you an out. So I was like, that is a lot tougher than what I may be going through. And I'm not saying dismissing anybody's struggle. Everybody goes through their own fucking struggle. But your struggle is not theirs and theirs is not yours. Yeah. But you got to figure out your way. You know what I mean? So we are a, I've always said it, we are a, we are a quote-based podcast, bro. Mm, I love true. fucking quotes. I love saying the way we feel and letting someone re- resonate with what we just said. Yeah. I feel like you have something in you, bro, that, that, that you're just ready, you're ready to tell the world. I so. got a quote. I, it goes along with everything that I've done and, and, and all the different hats I've worn in life and all the different phases. And So the quote goes as this. It goes, we're not the titles we chase, but the hard work it took to get there. That's good. Man. Yeah, man. It's fucking good. Yeah, I, I wrote that the other day, and I was like, exactly, because trying to put words to you know, I'm not the Army Ranger. I'm not the college baseball player. I'm, I'm not. I'm not this actor. I'm. I'm the hard work it took to get there, and that means that I can do anything with that hard work. That hard work and effort is actually the foundation of what it took to get anywhere. And so, yeah. a lot of us chase titles, and those titles have no value. But the hard work is what you can take with you anywhere. It's um, man, how do you how do you maneuver through there, bro? <laughs> I was like. I was, yeah, so I was you, gonna say mine, but now it's just, I feel a little fine now, you know. Like, to top that, holy shit, you know. <laughs> Live fast. <laughs> if you're not first, you're last. Ricky Bobby. <laughs> Yo. 
<laughs> All right, then come on, bro. Off the top, bro. Uh, off the top. All right. Um, it might not top yours, but this is this is off the top. Take this however you want, and it goes back to your work ethic, your work ethic, and don't expect to get lucky if you're not putting in the work. Mm. That's not it. Let me tell you, that's oh, not oh, the, oh, that's oh, not the quote. Oh, oh. That's not the quote. That was that's good it. though. It, the quote is: "In order for you to win the lottery, you first have to make money to buy the ticket." Mm. So I like that. Mm, dude, don't I expect like to get lucky. Oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um. Mine is not really going to be a quote, and I'm gonna. I I feel doing like doing this because of the conversation that w- that we've just had right now, that someone did for me when I needed it the most, when I didn't anticipate that I needed it. Right, I was just blind to it. I I didn't want to accept the blessings that were coming my way because I felt like I wasn't worthy enough. So, we're what we said in the intro, right? Apart from being all apart from you being everything you you are you are a husband and a father mm. and the way you talked about your kids talking about your 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 little girl that you found a purpose you know it i understand you because i'm a father myself but everything you have done up until this point all the good the bad the ugly the pretty got you to sit here with the world to see you it got you to have another day of life. You woke up the next day and you were able to live. You found your purpose. A lot of people were gone too soon before they found their purpose or were taken away before they found that. You're still here living, breathing, and you're serving your purpose. And without them even maybe even telling you, you have helped so many people throughout your journey that you may not have known it just yet. But just know in the conversation that we just had today, you helped me in a certain way. You helped him and them. And I know for a fact that without knowing your kids, they're proud of you. And without knowing your brother that's in heaven, they're so proud of you. So I want to thank you um, so much for everything you have done um, up until now, man. Like something in me, bro, is... We talked about loss, and 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 I tell him to myself too. Like I know my brother was looking down on me, and, and I'm sure he'll tell me, "Stop crying, motherfucker." But I know your brother in in arms, that's looking down on you, brother, is so proud of you and the man you became and your purpose in life, and is thankful that you are willing to be that person for everybody, that hardcore leader for everybody that needs that. The way he was that for you, you're that for everybody else. So, I, I something just I needed to say that to you. I appreciate it. That's the podcast, big guys. They told us live pod, and make sure you subscribe, my brother. Thank you. Thank you, big dog. Yes, appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe. Do the duty, and you may stay tuned because 2023 we're coming in hot, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Something, bro. Something just...